Uh, Mr. Gourley, our attendees mostly in, are we ready to start? Yes, we could start now. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome to the California Privacy Protection Agency's March 2022 pre-rulemaking informational sessions. My name is Jennifer Urban. I'm the chairperson of the board for the agency. Um, other members of the board are here with me this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful to see you all. And I'm looking forward to um, today and tomorrow. I now call the meeting to order and would like to ask our moderator, Mr. Justin Gourley, to please conduct the roll call. Okay, thank you, Chairperson Urban. I will start the roll call now. Ms. Della Torre. Present. Mr. Lay. Present. Ms. Sierra. Present. Mr. Thompson. Present. Chairperson Urban. Present. Chairperson Urban, five board members are present. Thank you, Mr. Gourley. Um, the board has established a quorum. Thank you very much, board members. Um, for uh, everybody's edification, um, we are having informational sessions today, which I'll describe a little bit more in a minute. Um, so for the most part, uh, board members will have our cameras off as we will be listening to the presentations along with you. So before I get started with the substance of the day, I, as usual, have some logistical announcements. Uh, first, I'd like to ask that everyone please check your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. Please also note that this meeting is being recorded. Meetings and events involving a majority of the board including informational and instructional sessions like these, will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. I'll first introduce the format for these pre-rulemaking informational sessions and then explain the mechanics of public comment today. First, let me sketch the format of these informational sessions so everyone has a sense of how things will proceed. Each day includes a set of expert presentations that will provide background information on topics that are potentially relevant to our upcoming rulemaking. I will open the session each day, and then we'll go into one item each day, comprising a series of presentations on that day's topic. Now, let me talk about how um, to engage in public comment. I will call for public comment after each item. So that is after our introductory item each day, and then after the presentations each day. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If you wish to speak on an item, please use the raise your hands function, which can be found in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will request that you unmute yourself for comment. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the video conference. I would like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Bagley Keen requires that comments be tied to the agenda items. Accordingly, please plan to comment on today's presentations at the end of today's session and tomorrow's presentations at the end of tomorrow's session. I'd like to remind everyone to stay on topic and please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Now, a little bit more about the schedule. Today, we plan to take a break for lunch after the first two informational presentations, depending on where we are on the schedule, and we'll take some shorter breaks if they're needed. Tomorrow we'll do the same. As I mentioned, this is being recorded. Um, we are also should have a transcript um, once that can come together. So uh, there will be, you know, you'll be able to see the information later if you need to come and go outside of breaks. My thanks to all the expert speakers who are taking time to present to us today and tomorrow, and to all the people working to make this meeting possible. I would like to especially thank the team from the Office of the Attorney General supporting us today. Mr. Malad Dalju, who is acting as our counsel. Mr. Justin Gourley, who is acting as the moderator. Ms. Trina Hurtado, who is the conference services expert who's organized the meeting infrastructure. And Ms. Stacy Heinsen for organizing administrative staffing and resources. I'd also like to thank the team at the Department of Consumer Affairs for managing our communications link and website technology generally. I would also like to thank the staff at the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Department of General Services, the Office of the Attorney General, and other agencies who continue to help behind the scenes. 
Before we move to today's presentations, I'd also like to take the opportunity to provide an update on our program of pre-rulemaking informational hearings and to invite your participation. We have announced two sets of pre-rulemaking events. First, these informational sessions that we're holding today and tomorrow, and second, stakeholder sessions. As I mentioned, the pre-rulemaking informational sessions today and tomorrow will provide background information on various topics potentially relevant to our rulemaking. The speakers for these informational sessions are academics who study relevant topics and officials from the California Office of the Attorney General, California Privacy Protection Agency, and the European Data Protection Board. We hope that these will provide helpful information. Um, it is important to note that our guest presenter's view should not be taken as the views of the agency or the board. They are the views of the presenters only. Our second set of pre-rulemaking events will be the pre-rulemaking stakeholder sessions, which we plan to follow a month or so from now. The stakeholder sessions are designed to gather stakeholder input, which is complementary to the written stakeholder input we received in response to our preliminary invitation for comment. Like the written input, this information will be very helpful. There are many knowledgeable stakeholders who can offer input based on their specific experience and expertise. I also wanna be clear about what I mean by expertise here. Today and tomorrow's speakers, of course, are people who've studied the topics they're talking about in a formal way. Expertise comes in many forms. Stakeholders of all types have experiences and expertise that will be extremely helpful. For example, an individual business's experience with the law, a consumer's experience, um, with their work to try to understand and exercise their rights, or a nonprofit that works with consumers or an association that works with businesses. All of these perspectives and more be very helpful um, uh, in understanding the backdrop of our potential regulations. So I encourage everyone who is interested in participating to sign up for the stakeholder sessions. You can find more information on our website, CPPA. .ca.gov on the regulations page. You'll find there information about logistics and a link to a sign-up form. Please note that the date for the stakeholder sessions is not yet set because staff are um, working on venue options that will allow us to have um, an in-person portion. But please do feel free to sign up now because the agency will contact you with options for participation and you're always free to decline if the final dates are inconvenient for you. Also, if we get to the stakeholder sessions and you haven't remembered to sign up, there will be opportunities for general public comment as well. So please check it out and please consider participating. Um, we would really value your input. And if you have questions, um, please feel free to write to info at cppa.ca.gov. I'd also like to extend my usual invitation to sign up for any of our email lists if you would like to receive announcements. You can find those um, on the CPPA website under contact us. All right, we will next move to the informational presentations for the day. Before we do, um, is there any public comment from those in the audience? As a reminder, if you would like to comment, uh, please press the raise hand icon on your screen. For those of you using dial-in function, you may press star nine to indicate that you would like to comment. Once I've called on you, use the star six command to unmute yourself. You'll then be called on and have up to three minutes to make your comment. Thank you, Mr. Gorley. There's uh, one comment, sorry. Uh, Great. Sharon, you are now unmuted. Thank you. Uh, could you do me a favor and clearly define what a stakeholder means? I'm unmuted. I would suggest that you go to the website and read more information about the sessions, but anyone who has an interest in the topics under the agency's jurisdiction. Okay, great. So us, us persons participating in this meeting this morning or listening into this meeting are considered stakeholders. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Gorley, is there anyone else? There is no one else. Okay, um, let's just wait for a little while and see if people are formulating thoughts. Um, and then if not, we will go to the next item. There is nobody else at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Gorley. Um, and uh, thank you um, for the public comment we received. We will now move to the informational presentations for the day. The topic of the presentations together um, is overview of personal information and the California Consumer Privacy Act. You can follow along on the agenda. Um, and again, please note, we will take some breaks. I'll introduce each speaker with a short biography and then they will present to us. I understand that speaker bios and the slide presentations, if there are any that speakers use today, will be available on the CPPA website as soon as they can be processed along with the recording and the transcript. So there should be plenty of um, opportunities to review the information if you'd like. Our first presenter is Ashkan Sultani. Mr. Sultani is the executive director here at the California Privacy Protection Agency. He is providing a presentation today on data flows. That is how consumer information is collected and how it flows through the data, eco data ecosystem, excuse me. Mr. Sultani, um, prior to coming to the agency, has been a researcher and technologist specially in specializing in privacy, security, and technology policy. He has focused his work on researching, understanding, and describing privacy issues online and explaining technology for those who are not experts, making him well-placed to describe data flows for us today. Mr. Sultani has previously served as a senior advisor to the US Chief Technology Officer in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and as the Chief Technologist for the Federal Trade Commission, advising the commission on its technology-related policy as well as helping to create its Office of Technology Research and Investigation. He has also contributed to multiple prize-winning investigative journalists, journalism teams working to understand various collections and uses of data. He holds a bachelor's degree in cognitive science from the University of California, San Diego, and a master's degree from the School of Information at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome, Mr. Sultani, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Can you all see my presentation? Awesome. Yes, we can. Start. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. As the chairperson mentioned, we'll start today with a brief overview of the types of data flows consumers might encounter as they navigate throughout their daily lives. Note, this presentation is fairly high level and is not intended to be exhaustive. It sketches out some of the common data flows to help ground further discussion. Data about us are collected and shared constantly. For example, when we go to the store, we might provide our name and address to a business in order to buy something or register for a warranty. That data might also be shared with a service provider, for example, with a logistics company to fulfill the item, or to a third party, such as a data broker, to generate a secondary revenue source for the business. Similarly, when we browse the web, we also share data with businesses. We may fill out a form, looking up a dictionary word, or provide our email address to a website in order to subscribe to the word of the day mailing list. This is information we intentionally share with one or more parties. Our information is also shared with businesses as a result of how the technology is designed. For example, as we surf the web, businesses automatically receive information about us, including our IP address, information about the type of browser and computer we're using, cookies and other identifiers, which I'll get into later in this presentation, our location, and if a user has enabled a global privacy control, their opt-out preference. Like the retail example, these data are typically shared not only with the business the consumer intends to interact with, but with service providers and third parties. 
For example, in this image, some of the ads, images, and underlying software facilitate the transmission of consumers' data with a number of third parties that the consumer is not directly interacting with. These can be advertisers, analytics companies, security providers, and data brokers. These entities can be service providers to the business or more commonly, third parties. Some data flows through elements that are not visible to the user. For example, many websites use third-party code, often known as pixels, to enable service providers and third parties to identify the user and monitor their browsing activities. How individuals are identified on the internet can vary. We're familiar with the idea that our identities are tied to our name, address, birth date, but there are other, often more robust ways to identify individuals. Social security numbers are one well-known example, but others such as email addresses, phones, device IDs, all serve the same purpose. In the examples before, I mentioned cookies, which are often unique strings of numbers and letters assigned to you by websites you encounter. Your browsers then store and transmit these identifiers every time you encounter the website, which enables those, those sites and services to uniquely identify you. Your phone also has a number of other unique IDs, especially, uh, specifically for profiling and targeting of advertisements, including a handful of immutable unique identifiers that uniquely identify your device and never change. Mobile devices also contain a variety of antennas, such as GPS and Bluetooth, and sensors, for example, accelerometers and ca cameras that regularly collect and make information available about us. And since we carry these devices with us every day and interact with them throughout the day, the volume of that data linked back to us can be significant. Information about our location, what apps we're using, who we call, and our list of friends and contacts are all often stored and shared. For example, when you use a location-aware app to look up a local restaurant, your phone will typically reveal your location, your identity, and possibly your food interest to one or more parties. And just as with the web, as users interact with their devices and mobile applications, and sometimes when they don't, as in the case of background applications and operating systems, that software can subsequently share and sell data with a number of parties beyond the original person or app the user shared with. Finally, because of their size and the way mobile apps are designed and the fact that we often use them on the run, smartphones often tend to be more limited in the way they can display notices and make users aware of data sharing that might occur. Here's an example of the various parties that might receive a user's location information. These include the mobile device manufacturer, the enhanced location provider, if there is one, the wireless service provider, the third-party location aggregators, and finally mobile apps, like the restaurant finder I mentioned. All of these parties may then further sell or share that information. As we move into a world of internet-enabled devices, additional data flows come into being. Health monitors, smart thermostats, internet-connected TVs, and smart speakers start excuse me, smart speakers enable a host of data uses which enable us to automate our daily lives, monitor our health, and optimize our energy usage. These Internet of Things or IoT devices thereby generate a great deal of information about us, such as whether we're home, when we're asleep, what shows we watch, and how active we are at night. As with other technologies, Often these data flow beyond the confines of our home to businesses and third parties and other entities consumers aren't, directing, aren't interacting with directly. For some IoT devices, it may be difficult for consumers to know what these underlying practices are. Some of these devices, for example, don't have screens or may become bundled as part of a purchase. Modern vehicles also have some of the same properties as smartphones and IoT devices. In fact, cars with remote access capabilities, like we see in some EVs and newer luxury vehicles, operate much like smartphones. They're often equipped with GPS, accelerometers, and cameras that monitor the occupant's location and activities. They can, for example, provide driving directions 
alert the driver when they're drowsy or monitor how aggressively someone accelerates in order to score their driving habits. Depending on the features the owner consents to or the manufacturer or dealership select, the car may share this information with a number of third parties. As I mentioned, often our modern devices share information with third parties. These third parties then use the information they collect from one or more businesses to inform what a consumer might do on other businesses. The collection and correlation of these activities across businesses create a profile about the user. And this profile used to inform the ads or products to show a user, how many times the ad was shown, whether a given ad was successful, for example, if the user purchased something as a result of seeing an ad, or make inferences about the user outside of our advertising space altogether, for example, related to media preferences, politics, and other inferred behaviors. Profiles aren't always used for advertising. Websites can also use, sorry, websites can also target ads based on the context of the website, not the profile of the user. For example, you can show car ads on an automobile enthusiast website without the reliance on and sale and transfer of personal information. Contextual advertising, as this is described, is a long-standing method of delivering ads. There are also newer methods that allow targeting of advertising and even conversion tracking, which I described as measuring whether an ad was successful without relying on the sale and sharing of the user's data across sites. Presently, the status quo, however, is to create a profile of the user as they traverse the internet for this and many other purposes. The previous slide showed the perspective of one party collecting data across a variety of websites and devices. However, websites, mobile apps, and publishers typically rely on networks of advertisers, typically third parties, who bid for and serve ads using an exchange. This works similar to a stock exchange. When a user visits a website or uses a mobile app that relies on an ad exchange, their information is often made available not only for, to the network exchange, but to hundreds of advertisers and data brokers the user does not direct, have a direct relationship with. The user's information is typically shared and stored by all of the potential bidders, regardless of whether or not the advertiser provides the winning bid. Typically, there are dozens, if not hundreds of advertisers that participate in each auction and millions of auctions every minute, which results in a great volume of consumers' data being automatically transferred downstream. Much of the information that I just described, as well as additional data that I haven't described, eventually flow to data brokers. Data brokers are companies that use data to profile consumers and resell that information for various purposes, some of which we'll hear about later today and tomorrow. Some of these uses might be to identify potential customers for new products, candidates for employment, or who to reach out to for a nonprofit fundraiser. While some of this information is collected directly from the consumer, then sold and shared, other times the information is purchased from other third parties, which then further sell or share your user's data, creating a cycle of data flows that the subject has limited visibility into. I trust the forthcoming presentation will help illuminate some of those uses and consumer remedies. So in this presentation, I've covered some of the typical ways consumers' data flow through the information ecosystem, including the traditional retail space on the web and through smartphones and other connected devices. This was a basic overview, not an exhaustive review. For example, brick and, rotor, brick and mortar retail locations that track individuals as they move about their stores were not mentioned. The purpose was just to provide basic introduction to the data flows and ground for their concern, excuse me, ground for their discussions. Hopefully it was helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Soltani, um, for that helpful presentation. Our next speaker is Ms. Lisa Kim, who will be presenting on how the California Consumer Privacy Act interacts with personal information data flows. Um, after Ms. Kim, we will take a lunch break. Um, so we'll have uh, one more presentation um, before we do take a break. Ms. Kim um, is a Deputy Attorney General in the Privacy Unit of the Consumer Protection Section at the California Department of Justice. Ms. Kim enforces state and federal privacy laws, promulgates privacy regulations, 
educates Californians on their rights and, in strat and on their rights and strategies for protecting their privacy, encourages businesses to follow privacy respectful best practices, and advises the Attorney General on privacy matters. As contemplated in the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, which created the CPPA, Ms. Kim is assisting the CPPA in its work. Before joining the office, Ms. Kim worked at an international law firm as a litigator with experience in various areas of law, including class action defense, legal malpractice, product liability, financial services, and privacy. Ms. Kim earned her BA magna cum laude from the University of California, Los Angeles, and her JD from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. We're very pleased that she is here with us today. And Ms. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay, so I wanted to thank you first, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad to be able to give this presentation. Um, this presentation is called How the CCPA Interacts with Personal Information Data Flows. Um, the goal for this presentation is to basically give a general overview of the CCPA and the CPRA amendments to the CCPA. It won't cover all aspects of the CCPA, but primarily the rights that are given to consumers and how those rights relate to the data flows that were previously presented by Mr. Sultani. Um, as an initial matter though, I always start with this dis disclaimer, which is I work for the California AG's office, but this presentation um, reflects my own views. It does not necessarily reflect the views of the state of California or the attorney general. So before we get started with regard to the specific rights that consumer have um, under the CCPA, um, I wanted to start off with some formative definitions because they do frame our analysis and understanding of how the CCPA or the CPRA, and I'll use those relatively interchangeably, um, affect data flows. So first off, um, let's talk about the definition of business. So the definition of business under the CCPA basically means a for-profit entity that does business in California, that collects and processes consumer personal information, and then also fit one of the following criteria. Either it has annual gross revenues in excess of $25 million, it, or it deals with personal information of 100,000 or more consumers or households. Now that is an increase because the CCPA um, pr previously had 50,000 consumers or households and the CPRA amendment bumped it up to 100,000. And then finally, um, or derives 50% or more of its annual revenues from selling or sharing consumers' personal information. And this is mainly targeted toward um, businesses that work with, that, that business is to sell or share consumers' personal information, such as data brokers. Now, the de next definition I wanted to speak about is personal information. Um, personal information is defined in the statute, but it is defined very broadly. It means anything basically reasonably capable of being associated to a particular consumer or household. And it includes things like identifiers, products and services used, biometric information, geolocation information, um, even things like olfactory information um, and inferences about a consumer. Um, there's also a newly um, specific subset of personal information that is introduced by the CPRA, and that is sensitive personal information, and that's separately defined, and I'll go into that a bit more in detail later in this presentation. So with regard to this definition of personal information as it pertains to the presentation that Mr. Sultana gave, um, many of those identifiers and things that he mentioned, such as cookies, um, can be considered personal information. Now, there's one thing that is not included, in, personal, in the definition of personal information, and that is public information, de-identified information, and aggregate consumer information. And all three of those terms are also separately defined in the CCPA. Now, to talk about the, the general key aspects of the CCPA, the CCPA that is now in effect basically has 
the following rights that are given to consumers. The right to delete, the right to know, the right to equal service or non-discrimination, and the right to opt out of the sale of personal information. And I'll go into this in greater detail later on. The CPRA amendments to the CCPA that are effective January 1st, 2023, also adds additional rights. Those rights include the expanded right to opt out of the sharing of personal information, the right to correct inaccurate information, the right to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal information, and also this idea of data minimization and purpose limitation. Now, before we get into um, this, I, I just wanted to point out, in addition to the rights, there are certain required disclosures that are provided by the CCK. These are obligations that a business has in giving disclosures to consumers. Um, there is an obligation to provide a privacy policy, and this basically is a one-stop shop um, where a consumer can find information about all of the business's data practices, as well as a description of their CCPA, CCPA rights and how to exercise them. And in some instances, there are also requirements that a business who holds or collects personal information of more than 10 million consumers has to report certain metrics about their CCPA and the requests that have been made of them. There is also a notice at collection. Um, a business must inform a consumer at or before the collection of, um, of personal information, the categories of personal information it seeks to collect, as well as the purpose, purposes for which they will be used. And there's an obligation that um, if you do not properly disclose these purposes, that you cannot use or collect those for any additional purposes not, not disclosed. Um, there is also a required disclosure of certain opt-out links. Um, under the CCPA, there's a do not sell my personal information link that needs to be posted on the business's website if the business sells personal information. Um, and then the CPRA amendments added the do not sell or share my personal information, as well as separately the limit the use of my sensitive personal information link. And I'll go into that in greater detail later. Um, they also provide a general alternative opt-out link where a consumer can meet both of those, um, exercise both of those, those rights at the same time. And finally, just to note, there is a notice of financial incentive that if a business is providing a consumer with an incentive or a price or service difference that is tied to the collection, sale or sharing or retention of personal information, they must provide a notice explaining the material terms. Now, to talk about the first right with regard to the right to delete under the CCPA, um, this, you know, I wanted to explain that this is generally a limited right because it only pertains to personal information collected from the consumer. And there are also some statutory exceptions that apply. So, for example, if the information collected from the consumer is necessary to provide the good or service, then the right, the request to delete by the consumer may be denied. Um, other things are security and fraud prevention, um, issues where a business may have to retain the personal information for a certain amount of time given legal obligations, that sort of thing. Um, to overlay this to delete um, with regard to the data flows that Mr. Soltani previously discussed, this right to delete applies to information from the first party business or the business in which the consumer is expecting to interact with. So for example, this right to delete would apply to say a retailer that a consumer goes into their store and says, you know, is purchasing um, goods from. Um, and if that retailer collects personal information from the consumer, then the consumer has the right to delete, um, request to delete that information. It also, applies to service providers. So for example, if a consumer interacts with a business and that business shares the information with the service provider, that service provider would also have to delete that information, but the request must go through the first party business. So the initial business that the consumer is interacting with. So it would apply to the service provider, but through the first party business. Um, from 
our experience in the DOJ, just uh, receiving consumer complaints and that sort of thing. There are some barriers that consumers do commonly face when exercising the right um, or some misconceptions or confusion that consumers may face. Um, that includes this understanding of not realizing that all these statutory exceptions do apply and may apply. There's also certain exceptions that are provided for in the law itself that applies to an entire title. They're set forth in Civil Code Section 1798-145 and includes things like certain information that is already governed under a different um, legal, legal uh, law, for example, HIPAA, the health information um, protection laws, um, or the GLBA, those types of situations, um, it may exempt the business from complying with a, right, a request to delete. Um, there's also the issue of verification. So when a consumer makes a request to delete, um, they must make a ver uh, they must be, uh, the request must be verified. So the business must take efforts to ensure that the consumer who is making their request is the same consumer about whom the personal information uh, sought to be deleted is about. And if you can understand that there is a concern for security that people can't um, just go around deleting things of other consumers without their permission. Now, moving forward, um, the next right, which is the right to know, not sure exactly what is going on here. Let's try this again. Uh, the right to know is basically a right that the consumer has to ask all businesses that have collected personal information about them the following things. They can ask for categories of personal information collected, categories of sources from which per, uh, personal information is collected, business purposes for collecting, selling, and sharing personal information and categories of third parties with which the personal information is shared. Another important part is that this request allows the consumer, this right allows the consumer to ask of the business the specific pieces of personal information that has been collected about them. So this is not just um, a general topic. So for example, if you're talking about a category of personal information, it may be browsing history. But the specific piece of personal information may be the specific links or the specific website links that uh, the consumer has um, interacted with. Now, again, overlaying this with the previous presentation, the consumer has this right with regard to both the business that the consumer expects to interact with, as well as third parties, such as data brokers. There's also the ability to find out this information from service providers, but again, that would be through the first party that, they, that the service provider is servicing. And again, from our experience, there are some barriers that consumers commonly face with, with regard to exercising this right, uh, specifically verification. Again, um, as, as you can imagine, there is likely to be some type of security risk if this information about specific pieces of personal information is collected going to the wrong person. And again, there's also certain exceptions to the CCPA when the personal information is governed by other laws such as GLBA, HIPAA, et cetera. Now, touching briefly upon this right, um, it doesn't particularly exclude, you know, seem to overlay with the data flows exactly, but I do want to mention it. There is a right to equal service, and that basically means that um, a business cannot discriminate against the consumer because they exercise their CCPA rights. And discrimination cannot take a form, uh, can be seen at, as denying goods or services to the consumer, charging or providing different rates or quality of goods or services. Um, there is an exception the it, you know, um, there is the added part, which Services can be denied or charged a different rate if the different level or quality is reasonably related to the value provided to the business by the consumer's data. Now, moving on, the right to opt out of sales, probably one of the hallmarks of the CCPA. Basically, the consumer has the right to tell all businesses that sell personal information to stop the sale of their personal information. 
no verification is needed, and the definition of sale is really rather broad. Um, it includes basically any kind of making available of personal information to another business or third party for monetary or other valuable consideration. It does not have to be monetary. It could take the form of a discounted services or free services for that matter. The right to opt out of sale also requires that the business provide a do not sell my personal information link on its website. And it's, there's a uniqueness to it because the opt out applies to consumers that are 16 years or older. But for those who are under 16 years of age, it is an opt in requirement. Now overlaying this again with the previous uh, presentation discussed, um, this right is available with both first parties, you know, the business that the consumer is interacting with, as well as third parties, data brokers and, and that sort. Um, with regard to service providers, um, this right does not prevent, does not prevent the first party from sharing personal information with a service provider because sharing information with a service provider is considered outside of the definition of sale. But to note, service provider is defined strictly in the statute. There are certain requirements in order for a service provider to be an actual service provider recognized by the CCPA. There must be a contract in place. That contract must specifically state that the personal information will only be used to service the business and cannot be sold. Um, it's also made clear in the CCPA regulations that our office um, promulgated that a service provider cannot use personal information from one business to service another business, except in limited circumstances related to fraud, that sort of thing. So essentially service providers would, when receiving personal information, if they are also servicing other businesses, would have to silo that information so that it, they can ensure that that information is only being used for the business for whom they are the service provider. And if a service provider does not or if a service provider does not comply with the requirements under the law, they are not a service provider and likely the business is selling personal information to that pseudo service provider. Um, again, from our experience and from consumer complaints, there are, some con there are some barriers that consumers may commonly face with regard to the exercising of this right. Um, sometimes businesses are not clear with regard to their representation that they do not sell personal information when in fact they, they do. Um, there's also an issue where even though this right, no verification is needed to exercise this right, oftentimes businesses may require some type of verification because, yes. Um, and while identification may be allowed, questions basically um, asking the consumer questions in order to allow the business to figure out whose information is whose, um, we, we often see abuses in this area. And also another commonly um, seen barrier would be the fact that um, the requirement under the CCPA is that a business is only required to disclose categories of third parties with whom they have shared or sold personal information with. So oftentimes a consumer who makes this right to opt out of sale request of the business, um, they don't know who else that business has sold personal information to. So there's no way to go down the stream and ensure that people that the first party business sold personal information to um, also honor the consumer's right under the CCPA. This somewhat changes under the CPRA. The issue here is that, um, you know, one way in which a consumer may be able to exercise this right with a bunch of third parties who have information about them is to go through our data broker registry on the California AG's website. However, unfortunately, there are so many data brokers already registered on the data broker registry. Currently, it's over 450 data brokers. It makes it very difficult for a consumer to be able to exercise their right to opt out of the sale for many businesses at once. Now, the CPRA amendment to the CCPA added this 
concept of right to opt out of sale or, or sharing. And this, you know, the definition of sale was broad already um, and may have already addressed many of the situations that are now covered under this new term of opt out of sharing. But uh, one of the issues were that it usually required some type of factual inquiry with regard to whether or not there was consideration for the sharing, um, whether or not uh, those with whom the information was shared were considered service providers or not. So this amendment of the CPRA added this language regarding share so that sharing means any sharing of personal information for the for cross contact for cross context behavioral advertising, whether or not for monetary or other valuable consideration. So while this may have already been covered under the original right to opt out of sale, this amended language just makes it all the more clear. Um, Again, here, there is no service provider exception for cross-contact behavioral advertising. So there's no instance in which a business can say, oh, I am using the service provider and sharing information with this service provider to provide me cross-contact behavioral advertising or personalized ads. Um, that is not something that can be done or um, done in this instance. All other parts are relatively the same. No verification is needed. A link is required on their website, and there is an opt-in requirement for those under 16 years of age. Overlaying this with what the previous uh, presentation discussed, you know, this very clearly addresses issues of real-time bidding or online behavioral advertising. And in this instance, it makes clear that a business must give an option to consumers to not share personal information for these purposes. Now, another right that has been added by the CPRA amendment were, uh, is this right to correct. Now, the right to correct applies to inaccurate personal information maintained by the business. And a business must sh uh, shall use commercially reasonable efforts to correct the inaccurate information. Um, other than that, the CPRA amendments very specifically state that the regulations will flush out the details of how this right is operationalized. Now overlaying this again with the previous presentation with regard to data flows, this right to correct under the law certainly addresses first party situations, so the business in which the consumer intends to interact with, as well with third parties such as data brokers. And again, with regard to service providers, only through the first party um, that they're interacting with. And in this, um, and the law also states that verification is required, required with regard to this right to correct. Now, next we have the right to limit. Um, the right to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal information is basically a right where a consumer can tell a business to only use sensitive personal information about them for what is necessary to provide the good or service that the consumer expects with some minor exceptions. Um, sensitive personal information is basically a subset of personal information, and it includes things like health information, financial information, social security number, um, as well as information about protected classes, such as the consumer's race or sexual orientation or information about their sex life, that sort of thing. So with regard to that subset of personal information that has a higher, um, that people <laughs> You can imagine why it would be more disconcerting for that information to be uh, proliferated about the consumer in the marketplace. Um, there is this additional right where the consumer can limit the business's use of that personal information to only what is necessary to provide the good or service that the consumer expects and some limited exceptions. Those limited exceptions um, you know, are generally tied to consumer expectation what is necessary and proportionate. Um, there's some exceptions for public good, for example, with, relation, with regard to security and fraud prevention, safety of people, quality of safety of goods. And then also some exceptions for uses that aren't quite as offensive, such as you know, non-personalized ads and internal business uses or warranties, that sort of thing. Now, again, overlaying this with what our previous presentation discussed, this right to limit applies to 
both the first party, the consumer, the business, the consumer is expecting to interact with, third parties as well, and then service providers through the first party. And in with regard to this right, no verification again is needed. Finally, I wanted to address a new, it's not per se a right as it is a, I, um, as a requirement, a data minimization and purpose limitations on a business. It's restrictions placed upon the business with regard to the collection, use and retention and sharing of personal information. Um, the collection, use, retention and sharing of personal information by the business has to be reasonably necessary and proportionate to achieve the purposes for which the personal information was collected or processed, or for, a, or for a disclosed purpose that is compatible with the context in which the personal information was collected. You know, now with regard to the CPRA amendments, a contract is now required for all sales and sharing of personal information. And the business has to specify a purpose with regard within that contract. And it obligates the third party service provider or contractor to comply with the CCPA. It also, the contract is also supposed to include certain rights by the business to ensure the compliance with the contract. Now, by overlaying this with what the previous presentation discussed, um, this is a fundamentally, a, this is fundamentally different than how businesses have been operating thus far. Previously, a business could generally do anything with adult personal information or personal information of consumers above the age of 16, as long as it was disclosed properly to the consumer. But now there's limitations. Even if you disclose what you're going to do, it cannot be reasonably necessary, proportionate, or compatible with the context in which the personal information was collected. So the new question to ask with regard to these data flows of where your personal information is going would be, would a consumer expect the business to use the personal information for this purpose? Is it reasonably necessary and proportionate for the sharing of that personal information or for that data flow? And is it compatible with the consumer's expectations? Um, this interacts with, again, the notice at collection that I mentioned previously, which is a required disclosure to the consumer. So now that notice at collection has to take into account um, whether or not um, you know, the purpose and use of the information is reasonably necessary, proportionate, and ach to achieve the, uh, the purposes for which the personal information was collected. So, there, you know, there's, this was a lot of information I imagine, um, and I have to say that this presentation is not exhaustive of all the things that are included in the CCPA as well as the CPRA amendments. There are a lot of nuances to this law. Um, but I hope this presentation gives you a better understanding of how the CCPA applies to data flows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. Um, much appreciated uh, that you were willing to take the time to walk us through um, all of that. Uh, so thank you. And thanks again, just generally to both of our first two speakers. We are running actually about five minutes ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, and we're going to go ahead and take our lunch break. Our lunch break will go until one o'clock p.m. We'll reconvene at 1 p.m. for the afternoon's presentation. Please feel free to leave the video or teleconference open or to log out now and back in at 1 p.m. It's up to you. Um, so with that, we will start our lunch break and see you all at one o'clock.
Okay, looks like we're recording and uh, you should be ready to go. Thank you very much, Mr. Gorley. And everyone, welcome back to the California Privacy Protection Agency's March 2022 pre-rulemaking informational sessions. I would like to remind everyone that we are recording this meeting. If you're just joining us, we are listening to a series of presentations, um, which you can find under agenda item two on your schedule, an overview of personal information in the California Consumer Privacy Act. We've had two presentations this morning and we have four more to come this afternoon. And then we will finish the day with public comment. I'll remind everyone how to engage in public comment when we get to that part of the day. Um, please I'll note that we may also take a short break at some point, not as long as lunch, um, but uh, uh, keep an eye out for that. And if you um, have to step away, again, we're recording, we'll have transcripts and the um, slides that if people use them will be available once we can get them processed and up on the website. So we will now continue with our first set of informational presentations. If you're following along, we are on day one, agenda item two, part C, business and consumer interactions, dark patterns. I am delighted to introduce two experts on this topic. Dr. Jennifer King is the Privacy and Data Policy Fellow at the Stanford University Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. An information scientist by training, Dr. King's research um, uh, is at the intersection of human-computer interaction, law, and the social sciences. Her work examines the public's understandings and expectations of pro online privacy, as well as the policy implications of emerging technologies. She has recent work on notice and choice, California's privacy laws, and dark patterns. She has served as a member of the California State Advisory Board on Mobile Privacy Policies and the California State RFID Advisory Board. Um, and I'm gonna pause here and say that RFID is for radio frequency identification, <laughs> um, because that's a rule in my classes at the university. Um, Previously, uh, Dr. King was the Director of Consumer Privacy at the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford Law School um, from 2018 to 2020. Before coming to Stanford, she was a co-director of the Center for Technology, Society, and Policy at UC Berkeley and was a privacy researcher at the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic at Berkeley Law. Dr. King holds a doctorate in Information Management and Systems from the University of California, Berkeley School of Information. And our second speaker on the topic is, doc, is uh, Professor Lior Strahilovitz. Hi, Professor Strahilovitz, thank you for joining us. He is the Sidley Austin Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 2002. Professor Strahilovitz's research interests include privacy law, property law, consumer contracts and law and technology. He is a member of the American Law Institute and has served as the Deputy Dean of the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Stahilovitz has authored or co-authored nine books and dozens of law review articles. He is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley and the Yale Law School. And with that, I will turn um, things over to Dr. King. I believe you or first, but you and uh, Professor Strahilovitz can um, organize the information however you like. Um, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Chairwoman Urban. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Give me one second, because uh, I'm going to draw a box around my slides and oh, move this out of the way. It takes me one second here. Oh, come on, Zoom. Sorry. This is just how I deal with PowerPoint. Okay, can everybody see that? I hope so, because <laughs> I can't see any of you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm Dr. Jen King. Uh, so I'm from Stanford HAI, although I need to note that I am speaking for myself and not for Stanford or HAI in my uh, remarks today. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about dark patterns um, very quickly. Sorry, here we go. Um, let me just set my timer and, okay. So I'm gonna go quickly over a definition of what dark patterns are, where we find them, how they actually do their work, uh, the difference between things that persuade versus manipulation, coercion, and deception, some types of dark patterns, and show you some examples. And I'll move pretty quickly as Lior will speak uh, after me in more detail in his specific research. Okay, so let's start. 
so what is a design pattern? So when we talk about dark patterns, the pattern part is something called a design pattern. The example on this slide are examples of toggle switches. So this is a form of design pattern, basically a building block that online designers use to build mobile apps and web pages. They're reusable components that we use over and over again that comprise the different parts of the interaction design, the way we interact with user interfaces, those things we, we look in the websites and mobile apps and so on. Um, and so when we talk about dark patterns, um, what we find right now is that the research community has really only been looking at dark patterns pretty closely for the last five years. And so there isn't a single definition necessarily that everybody is completely coalesced around. So I'm gonna go through a couple here. Um, but what we're talking about, um, starting with Harry Brignall's um, definition, Harry uh, created the first dark patterns website, darkpatterns.org. It's a great resource if you'd like to learn a little bit more about dark patterns. Um, he's called them a user interface that has been carefully crafted to trick users into doing things. They are not mistakes. They are crafted with a solid understanding of human psychology, and they do not have the user's best interests in mind. And then uh, Lior, in his work that he'll be presenting after me, he's called them techniques that, you, that manipulate users to do the things they would not otherwise do. <clears throat> um, another definition that I like a great deal uh, comes from colleagues at Princeton where they've looked across all the different ways that people have described dark patterns, and they've defined them as user interface design choices that benefit an online service by coercing, manipulating, or deceiving users into making unintended and potentially harmful decisions. So the idea here is that a dark pattern is something in an interface that essentially gets you to do something that you didn't plan to do or didn't necessarily want to do. And so I'll talk more about that as we go through. Um, so first, the reason why this is relevant today is both the CCPA and the CPRA have references to dark patterns. So in the CCPA, uh, there is specific text that in terms of describing those do not sell opt-outs that you may have heard about earlier today, um, there's language that basically tries to prevent different forms of dark patterns in those opt-outs to make sure that when people are opting out, they are given a clear way of doing so and not presented with an interface that makes it difficult for them to, to enact those opt-outs. Uh, the CPRA actually includes a specific definition of dark patterns, uh, which is a user interface designed or manipulated with the su substantial effect of subverting or impairing user autonomy, decision making or choice as the further defined by regulation. And it's specific to uh, consent interfaces right now in, in the way that the statute was put before the voters. Um, and so when we talk about dark patterns right now in the CPRA, they've been very narrowly focused in terms of consent and the, basically the touch points where we as individuals consent to give up personal information online. And so there is uh, some momentum right now to actually move away from the term dark patterns uh, for two reasons. One is that actually a number of people are actually quite confused about the use of the term patterns, just not having any background in the kind of user human computer interaction space, uh, such as I'd have. And so there's that piece of it, but then there's also concerns about the unintended implications of the term dark. And so some of the ideas that have been proposed are to say deceptive or unfair design patterns, or to use manipulative or deceptive design as a term. There really isn't kind of a common agreement yet. Um, I will use manipulative design throughout this presentation. Um, but one of the problems with this right now is that the term dark patterns has already been written into legislation, including the CPRA, for example. Uh, and it also has, the word deception in particular has very specific legal meanings, which I actually will define a little bit later. And so calling it deceptive patterns, for example, may make sense in a research context, in a casual context, but in the legal context, that may actually be somewhat misleading. Um, and so we're still at this point where people are trying to figure out kind of where to go with this, um, but I just want to raise that up front. Okay, so context. Where do we find deceptive designs and dark patterns? And so right now there are three primary contexts that we see them. So we see them in uh, online shopping and e-commerce uh, where people essentially uh, experience usually a loss of income or not income, but they, they lose money as a result of dark patterns or they may experience price discrimination. Uh, in the privacy space, in terms of disclosure and consent, where people are forced to give up more personal information than they would desire, or forced to consent any personal information in cases where they may not actually want to do that at all. 
Um, in the gaming and gambling spaces, we have what we call addictive dark patterns or attention-based dark patterns. And those are the things that it, people find very hard to stop an activity once they're engaged in it. And so that's a space where uh, I, I would call it more emergent. There's more research needed to really try to understand that space. Um, predominantly though, we're seeing them in these e-commerce contexts. And where you find them specifically are at these places I call decision points. And those are places where as an individual, you're making some kind of decision or you're executing an action. So you're, you're deciding between two buttons, for example, I consent or I don't consent. Uh, you know, that's a decision point. Uh, you know, before you hit, I agree in a terms and conditions acceptance or before you make an online purchase. Those are all kind of decision points where we most often see dark patterns uh, show up. Okay, so how do these actually work? And so this is an interesting issue. Um, so we think that in general, what they, the way they succeed is that they are using kind of two, way, two flaws in how humans think. Uh, something we call heuristics, which are mental shortcuts that we all use as a way to kind of make decisions easier for us to make, as well as co cognitive biases. And these are demonstrated systematic errors in the way we think. There's a couple of things I want to kind of comment on first uh, before I go on on this one, which is first that a lot of this work comes out of the field of behavioral economics, and it, it works under this assumption that there is this kind of perfect rational consumer. And so we all know that no one, maybe with very few exceptions, is a perfect rational being. And so a lot of what we're documenting are, you know, you know what I think most of us would consider normal errors in the way we think, or you know, just kind of you know normal things in the course of our everyday lives because none of us is kind of a, a perfect rational being. Uh, second, the most of this research has been done within the kind of US and European Western tradition. And so while we assume that they are global, there really hasn't been much contextual research or cross-cultural research in this area. And so you know, I say that with basically a big caveat that you know, we don't know necessarily if these are in fact, are all of the things we call biases and um, heuristics are necessarily you know, globally experienced. Uh, but certainly within uh, our society, we have demonstrated that they exist. Uh, and I'm not going to go into them in detail, but just to note that, you know, there are examples such as the availability heuristic. And that's one um, where you'll often make a decision based on like, the, the most recent piece of information that you've been exposed to. Or something like hindsight bias, where you think back over an event and the type of thing that you're, that you're referencing or the information you're referencing, and it makes it seem as if that you've, you knew that information all along, um, yet it may have been something that only you know, came apparent to you after an actual event occurred. And so um, this, this space has been influenced, or dark patterns have been influenced both by research in this space, but also through the work by one of my Stanford colleagues, BJ Fogg, uh, and BJ Fogg, is kind of the, we, I'd probably call him the father of what we call persuasive design. And so his work in the early 90s or mid 90s to the early 2000s really began to focus on what is it that, how can we generate websites or how can we design ways of interacting online that really persuade people, that make it easy for you to decide to sign up for something or to stay engaged with something. And so there's this whole field of persuasive design that has really contributed to are the kind of the introduction of dark patterns because as we've seen things that we can be can be used to persuade can also be used to potentially deceive we also have seen um, kind of a counter movement in things called nudges for example where you know the focus there is to try to nudge people into making decisions that act in their best interest so one of the classic examples in this space is the idea that you know, you may have a job that automatically enrolls you in a 401k retirement savings plan, rather than making it dependent on you to sign up because it's in your better interest to go ahead and be enrolled in something like that than to have to take the effort on your own to enroll in it. And so these kind of positive nudges, these things that we see try to help people make good decisions end up being hijacked to help you, help you make uh, decisions that are more in the best interest of the company that is producing them rather than you. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for a second to talk about digital dark patterns just to give you an analog to what dark patterns mean in kind of the physical space. And so the example I have here, this is something called a planogram. And this is a planogram of a grocery store. And just to kind of illustrate uh, the similarities between kind of these physical built environments and the online space 
is to note that when you go into a large grocery store, and I, you know, I'm talking a, a major grocery store, not your corner market, what you'll find is that that entire space has been very carefully designed from top to bottom, uh, from the point of view of not only everything in terms of the aisle placement, but literally everything on the shelves. And marketers pay, you know, tremendous tremendous amounts of money to place their products at particular place, places in that grocery store. And so as a consumer, what you may do is you may walk into a grocery store and decide you need something like a gallon of milk, probably one of the most common purchases people make, especially if they're in a hurry. But what you'll find is that more often than not, that milk is going to be located at the back of the store. And why is that? It's because the store has been designed to kind of optimize the idea that for people who need to come in and, and buy just a couple of, you know, kind of staple goods, the things you need all the time, we're going to force you to walk through the entire store. So it increases the likelihood that you're going to pick up a product as you walk through. And so, you know, Online environments are very similar in that way in that they are completely designed spaces. You know, there's nothing accidental about them. Everything about them has been planned from top to bottom. And so your journey through that space has been very carefully designed. Of course, in a supermarket, you know, you're not forced to walk down a particular aisle. But again, the entire experience has been optimized to try to get you potentially pick something up as you walk through so that you walk out with more items than you intended to purchase when you walked in. And so, as it happens, uh, here, in, I, I'm a resident of the city of Berkeley, and in Berkeley, we have one of the first laws, I think, in the nation that has attempted to actually counter that type of persuasive design, and that's by eliminating all sweet um, junk foods and such at the checkout um, aisles. I'm actually not sure if this has potentially been enforced yet, um, but just to say that you know, there's this sense that even in these built environments that this type of persuasion is is meaningful, it, it works, you know, and especially if, if you're somebody uh, with a small child and you go grocery shopping, you have that sense of things just being automatically added to your, uh, your grocery basket as you walk through, at least that's what happens to me. Um, <clears throat> and so just to say that, um, you know, even in the, in the, um, even in the shopping context, uh, uh, the market context, um, you know, there are forces at work that are deliberate decisions at work to really persuade you into making particular purchases. The one thing though that we don't have necessarily is you're not going to leave the grocery store again, unless you have uh, a small child tagging you like I do uh, with extra things added to your cart. And yet that is one of the examples that we see in the e-commerce space that people will actually check out of an online merchant and find that they've been enrolled in a program that they didn't set necessarily sign up for or didn't affirmatively sign up for or even as far as having things added to their cart or added to a service in terms of extra fees that they just that weren't disclosed at the beginning and suddenly they're there by the time you get to the checkout. Um, as a side note, uh, I will note that I think we are beginning to see dark patterns in these kind of physical spaces as well, not just on screens, but actually on screens in these places. Uh, just this morning, my husband took a trip to uh, a local large pharmacy chain um, and at the credit card terminal was presented with uh, a, a screen that gave him two options, either to accept that the pharmacy would send him text messages or to print info, which was a choice that basically gave him a printed slip from the register that made it unclear whether he was actually now enrolled in the program or if it was they were going to actually, you had to follow the instructions on it to unsubscribe from these text messages. So just to point out that this is a phenomenon that's becoming very widespread, not just again on mobile apps, mobile devices or online, but potentially also in real life checkout screens. Okay, so um, what types of dark patterns are there? So let me go through these very quickly. Um, so first um, we have kind of two general areas of dark patterns. First, we have those that modify the decision space. And those are the ones that either remove options that maybe you would have wanted, you know, things that make it harder to actually make that decision versus those that manipulate the information flow. And those are the ones that potentially kind of don't disclose to you everything that you should know in order to make a very you know, well-reasoned decision. And so things that we see that modify the decision space are what we call asymmetric, you know, patterns that essentially, that essentially emphasize choices that benefit the company over a choice that benefits you, such as if you hit see a screen with a big green I accept button and a link in very small letters that says maybe I don't accept, you know, that's an asymmetric interface. It's emphasizing one choice over the other. Uh, there are covert ones, which essentially try to steer you towards making a purchase or a decision without all the knowledge you need. Uh, so hidden fees, I think, are a good example of that. 
um, restrictive interfaces where, you know, and I'll have an example of that in just a couple moments where you're given an accept button, for example, in a condition, but no way to, to reject it, only the accept. Um, so your options are restricted. Uh, and in the world of kind of manipulating the, the flow of information to you, you have those that will kind of hide or obscure the information that you need in order to make a decision. Uh, maybe it's there, but you have to you know, try to hunt for it. We famously see these with privacy policies, the fact that there's you know, maybe information that you as a consumer is interested in, but it's buried in you know, 5,000 words of a privacy policy that you would have to hunt through. And then we have outright deceptive interfaces. So things that, um, as I'll define in a little in a moment, um, that actually kind of produce false beliefs, things that are essentially lies that are misleading you actively. Okay, so let me dig into a little bit of the differences between persuasion versus deception, coercion, and manipulation. Okay, so persuading is when we really appeal someone directly to make a decision. And so, you know, this is me potentially, or I would say most advertising falls into this category. You know, if you're flipping through a magazine, you see an ad, you know, that's a persuasive interaction. They're trying to get you to buy the shoes, the book, the vacation, what have you. But, you know, it's, it's a fairly straightforward interaction. And you know it might be appealing to you, or it may not. You know it's, it's kind of the the um, the mystery of advertising, if you want to put it that way. Uh, deception is actually this planting of false beliefs. Okay, so this is this very specific um, meaning uh, where the practice basically is you've been lied to, or you've been misrepresented to. You know the the diet pills say you'll lose twenty pounds, and you don't lose any pounds. You know it's that type of misleading information. Coercion is when we constrain your options. And so that essentially the only kind of logical way forward for you when you're being coerced is to end up making the decision that the coercing party wants you to make. I think a lot of dark patterns fall into this space where you're not exactly prevented sometimes from making a choice, but it's clear that the easiest way forward is to just do what the company wants you to do. And then we have manipulation. Manipulation is more of this hidden influence, okay? And so this is when um, somebody is trying to get you to do what they want you to do, but they're not being very obvious about it. They're potentially, um, you know, exploiting your vulnerabilities. And this is an area I think of a special concern to us in the privacy space, given the information asymmetry between most of us and advertisers and large platforms that a company could have enough information about you to try to understand, you know, Jen is much more of a, you know, she seems much more inclined to buy things after 10 p.m. than somebody else. And so we'll show her ads if she's online after 10 p.m., you know, with, you know, particular things that we think, you know, make her more, you know, willing to buy, just as an example. Okay. Um, so let me just mention very quickly, uh, in terms of like trying to understand dark patterns from a consumer's perspective, or if you're looking to actually report your own experience with dark patterns, I, along with some colleagues at Stanford at the Digital Civil Society Lab, have taken over the website darkpatternstipline.org. Uh, it's a public resource. There are examples there, and people can actually go and report their own experiences with dark patterns to the tip line as well. I'll just note that if you do so, please, please, please include a screenshot, because otherwise it's very hard for us to verify them. Okay, so how did we get here with dark patterns? Um, so one of the biggest reasons that we've been able to, that, we're, that the dark patterns have been able to proliferate has been something called A-B testing. And this is the ability of companies to test interfaces at an incredibly large scale. You know, as a researcher, speaking for myself, if I wanted to do some type of user test, I would have to go recruit, you know, most likely a group of, let's say 20 or 50 Stanford undergraduates and pay them and try to do some kind of small scale test. But if you're a large platform, or even just a you know decent sized company, you now have the ability to do these kind of A-B tests at scale with thousands and thousands, and in some cases, millions and millions of customers. And so this allows you the ability to really refine interfaces and try to find the ones that lead to the most conversions, you know, the most sales, the most memberships, whatever it might be. And so the example here on this slide, you know, there are two interfaces there for the same website, interface A, interface B. And they show you that in the graph, you know, 23.7% of people converted when they saw interface A. And so through this kind of large scale A-B testing, companies have really been able to pick up on precisely the types of things that kind of push people over the edge in terms of what gets them to sign up for something and what doesn't. Okay, so now I'm gonna walk through a handful of examples and then I'll hand it over to Lior for his piece. Uh, so this is a deceptive type of dark pattern called false urgency. And so, 
This again, mostly we see this in the e-commerce context. And what it's acting on is this idea that um, time is running out, you know, it, which is something you know, we see a lot in, in, uh, in the sales sphere. You know, act now, limited time offer. Uh, you know, the versions of that we see online are you know, when you get a, basically a countdown timer. Um, you're told you know, eight other people are looking at this right now. You'd better act um, and so on. And so one of the things that researchers have found in many cases that, is that often these timers are completely fictional. And so you actually look at the code for the website. If you just hit refresh, you know, the timer will start over. It's not actually tied to any kind of realistic analytic system, for example. Um, that's not always true, but it has been largely true. And so, you know, especially when those are completely fictional, it's absolutely, we consider them a dark pattern. Okay. Uh, Content-based dark pattern, something we call guilt shaming or confirm shaming. This is a fairly wide experience. Most of you probably have experienced something like this. Uh, you know, where basically you're being guilted or kind of shamed into making the choice you want to make. Um, I actually find these to be remarkably effective, even in my own life, even though I work in this area, because sometimes it just makes me stop and have to sit there and think, wow, am I really a bad person to click this link? I mean, yes, I know I'm not a bad person to click the link, but it makes you stop and think. Um, and so this is kind of a form of harassment through guilt um, that we see repeatedly in this space, um, especially when people are unsubscribing to a service. Okay, this is another thing called nagging. Uh, again, another form of harassment where essentially you're just repeatedly asked to agree to something, even maybe after you've said, no, I don't want to do it, uh, which I think the, the buttons here are a good example of that. Your choices are maybe later or okay. You know, maybe later, kind of implying that the door is left open, you haven't said no, but maybe if I keep asking you over and over again, you'll just say yes. Uh, this is a content-based uh, dark pattern with uh, confusing double negatives. So where, again, you're using language to describe something in a way that's unclear and misleads people. Do you wish for your record not to be sent to my health record? You know, what is the answer to that? <laughs> you know, is no, does no mean yes or does yes mean no? And so uh, that's the type of thing that makes people have to really stop and think and grapple with what's being asked of them. And there is absolutely no reason to phrase anything that way. You can you know, always make it much more clear that, clear than that. Um, obstruction. So again, this is a way of kind of, of coercing you and preventing you from making the choice you want to make. Um, so these are just examples. Uh, actually, the, the one on, um, I think you're right, apologize if that's not correct. Uh, we offer several ways to cancel your subscription. You know, that's an example that we see commonly where signing up for something is quite easy, takes a couple clicks, you're subscribed. And then if you want to cancel a service, guess what? Uh, you have to chat with a customer service agent. You have to get on the phone. There's no simple just cancel my account click. Um, that's something that's extremely common um, and obviously puts a lot more load on you as the consumer to have to grapple with that than it, than it would otherwise. Um, okay, so dark patterns in terms of um, <clears throat> the consent space. And so I apologize. Let me take a quick sip of water. Okay, uh, so all of us have probably seen cookie consents or opt out different terms or opt out consents. Um, you know, these are often confusing or in the, the example of the blue one on the screen, you know, you're given a single choice, that's to accept. You know, what is your choice otherwise? Probably to close the browser or close the app and walk away. Um, so it's basically a take it or leave it situation. Um, you know, same with the example on the bottom, your only option is yes. I want to continue to see relevant ads. No, I don't want to see ads. It's just not even given to you. Uh, the other one on the screen I, I included just because it is extremely confusing. You know, you're given the, the opportunity to probably reject all cookies, except all cookies are done this, except it's just unclear exactly how to even navigate that particular set. Um, relevant to us here in California and uh, the CCPA are the do not sell requests. I don't know if any of you have potentially tried to uh, make do not sell requests, but one of the things we have been observing is that uh, often they're being um, implemented using toggle switches and that the state of those toggle switches is often extremely unclear. That it's not, you know, if you go through these, uh, it's not clear whether if you've turned the toggle switch to on versus off, whether you've actually agreed to, um, to opt out or not. <clears throat> and so that's a, that's a dark pattern we've seen repeatedly in this space. Okay. So my last slide, and I think I'm just at time. Uh, what are some of the open policies, policy issues in this space? So um, what I would just note is that 
with the CUPRA, the current scope is really framed tightly around consent. Um, but I think that there's an opportunity there to rethink consent standards within that space. And that's something I talked about uh, in a paper I wrote um, in the Georgetown Law Tech Review last year. Just that I think there's more opportunity not just to really narrowly think about how we consent, but more broadly think about how we make consent something a lot more better and effective for people. Um, within the privacy space, especially, I think there's uh, ways to identify areas outside of just consent where we see privacy and manipulative design uh, interact, and such as when we see personal data being used to influence your choices or your decisions. Um, I also want to note that measuring and assessing the impacts of manipulative design requires expertise. And so this is something that um, the agency, I would argue, really needs to consider as it hires its staff, uh, that you need to have experts on hand who understand these issues. This is outside of the kind of normal law realm of just um, of um, legal counsel. Uh, and that you actually need a way to connect with the public in order to receive complaints or suggestions or reports of dark patterns. Um, I think that's going to be a very vital issue. Um, and then finally, I, what I have heard often from businesses in this space as I give these talks is that businesses really want to see positive guidance on kind of what to do and what not to do um, and potential standards around what is acceptable practice when we ask people for choices or to make decisions. And with that, I will stop screen sharing and hand it over to Lior. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, that was really terrific. And thank you, uh, Jennifer, for the introduction. I'm going to um, pull up uh, my slides if, uh, if uh, Zoom is going to cooperate, which is always, as Jen illustrated, um, a little bit of it off. Well, you know what, let me try this. This will put me in the corner of the screen, but I think that actually should work out just fine with these slides. Okay, so um, uh, uh, it's really a, a pleasure to, to be here to talk about some of the research that uh, Jamie Liguri and I have been uh, doing on dark patterns over the last uh, several years. And uh, this will be a, um, uh, a sort of data heavy uh, presentation where I'm able to talk about a lot of the experimental work that we've done, um, looking at dark patterns, trying them out on ordinary American consumers and seeing how they uh, respond. So uh, before Jamie and I started researching uh, these dark patterns questions that um, Jen has um, really thoughtfully introduced, um, we had some existing academic research about dark patterns that uh, highlighted their prevalence, um, their increasing prevalence. These are uh, probably the two best uh, academic papers by teams of researchers in the United States and in Europe that have documented, um, often through using really um, creative uh, uh, techniques in computer science, the proliferation of dark patterns um, and their prevalence, especially on the more uh, far-reaching and successful sites in uh, e-commerce. But um, knowing that dark patterns is prevalent uh, doesn't necessarily tell you that they work, although it implies that they do, because after all, why would companies be investing a lot of money in shifting over towards dark patterns if they weren't uh, gaining some additional revenue? Yet we were really kind of flying blind with respect to um, which dark patterns are more effective, which dark patterns are relatively effective, and how effective in general are the kinds of cocktails of dark patterns that we often see uh, employed at the websites and in the apps uh, that Jen uh, just illustrated. So to that end, uh, Jamie and I have launched a couple of very large scale uh, experiments. We're talking about uh, thousands of Americans um, uh, in our experiments. And what's really important to understand about our research is that we're gonna um, run these dark pattern experiments, but it's kind of like running a, a Gallup poll or, or a, a Los Angeles Times poll. Um, the group of American adults that we're um, going to expose to dark patterns look just like the United States adult population, or at least the portion of the adult population that has internet access, which is about 91%. Um, and so it's census weighted, meaning uh, our sample of respondents is going to look just like the uh, US adult population in terms of 
gender and uh, race and age and region of the country and education level. And that's important both because we can see how dark patterns are operating on you know, real everyday people like you and me, but also we'll be able to dig in, into some of the demographics and see whether some groups are more vulnerable to dark patterns than, uh, than others. So um, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, a couple of experiments. Uh, in the first experiment, we began by um, actually taking about 10 minutes of uh, people's time and asking them to answer a whole series of questions about their privacy expectations and their privacy preferences. Uh, and then after people um, answered this battery of questions and also provided some demographic information about themselves, um, we told them that uh, on the basis of their answers, we were calculating their privacy propensity scores. Um, and it turned out based on their answers, our algorithm had identified them as someone who cares more about privacy than uh, the average person. We told everybody that everybody kind of thinks, just about everyone kind of thinks they care a lot about their own privacy. So that wasn't an especially fishy story. And then we told people, hey, we have good news. Uh, we've partnered with the nation's uh, largest provider of identity theft protection. Uh, and based on the information you've already given us, uh, we've gone ahead and signed you up for a plan that will protect you against uh, identity theft and uh, loss of your personal uh, data. Um, this will be free to you for a trial period. And then uh, after uh, some months, uh, you'll be converted over to a paid subscription, but that's okay. You can cancel at any time. In other words, we were trying to replicate the kinds of uh, product pitches that people might often encounter uh, online. Then what we did is we randomly assigned our uh, research subjects is about a little over 1700 people in the first experiment. And we randomly assigned them to one of three conditions. Um, and I'll show you what each of these conditions look like. There was a control group that really wasn't exposed to any further dark patterns. There was a group that was exposed to, you know, potentially a couple of dark patterns. And then a group that was going to potentially be exposed to a cocktail, of maybe five or six different dark patterns uh, mixed together. And we wanted to see um, how getting exposed to no dark patterns, a few dark patterns, or a lot of dark patterns might affect behavior. So this is what the group that didn't see any dark patterns saw. Uh, they saw what I regard as a very neutral choice architecture. Here's this plan. Um, we're going to go ahead and sign you up for it, but you can accept it uh, or, you or you can decline it. There's no asymmetry here. This is a simple, simple choice between uh, yes and no. Um, and uh, that's unproblematic from my perspective. Um, this is what the mild dark patterns group saw. Uh, no longer did they get a, ch a choice between yes and no, but rather a choice between accept and continue, uh, which is in red and also marked as recommended, or other options. Okay, so we're seeing several dark patterns here. We're uh, making something the default choice. We're suggesting that it's that consumers are would be better if they went with the default. And we're also putting some obstruction in front of consumers so that it's going to be easier to sign up than it will be to reject the data protection plan. If they clicked other options, then they were going to see uh, this screen in the lower uh, left quadrant, which is uh, some confirmed shaming, a choice between I do not want to protect my data or credit history. And after thinking about it, I would like to go ahead and sign up for the plan. So if you were in the mild dark patterns condition, you were exposed to these screens, one additional screen that really didn't uh, do anything uh, significant in terms of boosting our acceptance rates. But I'll show you, uh, as I'll show you in a little bit, compared to the control group, the percentage of American consumers signing up for a data protection plan was very substantially higher, even if they just saw these two dark patterns. And then finally, as I told you earlier, there was another group we called the aggressive dark patterns condition, and they were potentially going to see a lot of dark patterns. So at first, they saw the exact same screens that the people in the mild dark patterns condition saw, accept and continue is marked as recommended, it's checked by default, um, and it's a choice between that and uh, other options. If they want to say no, they're going to have to click through a couple of screens. If they want to say yes, they're going to be able to do that really easily. Okay, so at the outset, the mild dark patterns and the aggressive dark patterns conditions looked alike, they were identical, and not surprisingly, the kinds of consumer responses we saw in the aggregate across these two screens um, were uh, quite similar. Um, but if you said no on those first couple of screens and you uh, found yourself in the aggressive dark patterns condition, we were going to make you jump through some additional loops in order to decline 
this plan uh, that we told our, our experimental subjects we were selling them. Um, first, uh, you were going to have to click through uh, up to three more screens in which we shared information about identity theft and why it's bad. And we uh, wouldn't let consumers uh, advance to the next screen for um, uh, 10 seconds. This is very similar to the kind of obstruction dark pattern that Jen showed you in her slides towards the end of the talk. The, well, we're processing your preference to not have cookies on your machine. This may take a few minutes. We were basically going for a similar kind of obstruction uh, dark pattern. Uh, and if they uh, were adamant and said, not yes, I want to accept, but no, I would like to read more information. They were going to have to click through uh, two more screens that looked uh, similar to this, and then finally arrive at uh, a dark pattern that contains a very confusing prompt along the lines again of Jen's examples. Um, if you select no cancel, are you canceling the subscription or are you signing up for the subscription? Well, are you sure you want to decline? No, I'm not sure. Okay, there's a lot of mental energy that needs to go in to figuring out that um, uh, if you select no cancel, you're actually going to be accepting the plan. If you want to reject the plan, you're going to have to click the box that says yes. Okay, so thus ended the experiment. We did want to gather some more information about how people experienced either the control group or the mild dark patterns or the aggressive dark patterns. And so we asked people to assess their moods um, after they finished our experiments on a one to seven scale. This is a standard technique in psychology. We asked people, would you be willing to participate in other uh, research by uh, the same researchers going forward? We asked people whether they felt free to decline the identity theft protection plan. And then we also had an open-ended box where people were allowed to just leave us comments about the experiment. And then after uh, people uh, went through uh, that information, we explained what we were up to. We made it very clear to consumers that we hadn't actually signed them up for anything and wouldn't be signing them up for anything. And we explained a little bit about uh, why we were interested in uh, dark patterns. Okay, so were these things uh, effective? Uh, it turns out they were highly effective, all right? So um, when we gave people a neutral choice between yes and no, barely more than um, one in 10 consumers wanted to sign up for this data protection plan. Um, but if we just exposed people to a couple of dark patterns, that 11% acceptance rate uh, jumped all the way from 25 to 26%. Uh, let me, from 11, let's say to 25. Um, let me explain why there's three columns here. Um, especially in the aggressive dark patterns experiment, some consumers were so ticked off by our obstruction dark patterns, those three screens, that you couldn't click through until 10 seconds had elapsed, that they actually closed out their browsers, exited the experiment, and forfeited the cash that they were uh, entitled to. Um, there's an interpretive question about whether you want to treat those people as having rejected the data protection plan. If you do, and I think that's a reasonable interpretation of the data, uh, then the acceptance rate is the third column. We call that the adjusted acceptance rate. If you want to exclude those people who dropped out of the experiment late in the dark patterns uh, conditions from both the numerator and the denominator, then you'd be focused on the middle um, uh, column. There's not a big difference in the mild dark patterns condition. Very few people dropped off. But as you can infer, in the aggressive dark patterns condition, we had a pretty substantial segment of our research pool, um, just about 5% of those who accepted did drop out. And so that's going to meaningfully affect whether the acceptance rate is 37% or 42%. But whether you're talking about 37 or 42, these are really large numbers, right? So at the very least, more than tripling the acceptance rates through potentially exposing people to three, four, five, or six dark patterns. When you think about this, these minor changes in designs are very substantially boosting acceptance rates uh, in our experiment and presumably in the real world as well. I told you we collected a lot of demographic information and hypothesis, one of our hypotheses going into the experiment was that dark patterns would be much more successful at manipulating less educated Americans than they would be at uh, manipulating Americans with college degrees or postgraduate degrees. And it turns out that hypothesis was justified. There were highly significant differences in the vulnerability of less educated Americans versus more educated Americans. And uh, these results weren't just significant, but they were very mathematically 
uh, large. So to give you a sense of this, uh, in the mild dark patterns condition, 21% um, of highly educated Americans accepted our data protection plan, but 34% of less educated Americans accepted that plan. 21% to 34%, even though in the control group, uh, the acceptance rates um, were essentially uh, identical. So these dark patterns, especially the mild dark patterns, uh, are quite successful at convincing less educated Americans uh, to accept a plan that they would otherwise be inclined to reject if they were presented with a neutral choice between yes and uh, no. And these results uh, uh, persist even when we control for the fact that less educated people tend to have uh, lower incomes than uh, highly educated people. Uh, and this is a result, by the way, that um, we replicated in our second experiment. I told you as well that we collected mood information from the people who we exposed to dark patterns. And this is really interesting. And frankly, um, this is one of the several results that surprised me. Um, uh, what's interesting is that uh, about this is that there's no statistically significant differences between those people who were exposed to no dark patterns and those people who were exposed to just a couple in the mild dark patterns condition. They were you know, equally happy. Um, people in the mild dark pattern condition were uh, not statistically more likely to leave us a nasty gram where we had that open-ended box from comments for comments. They weren't you know, particularly likely to drop out of the experiment. 98.5% of the people in the mild dark patterns group um, continued the experiment all the way through to the end. That does look different when we're talking about aggressive dark patterns, where people potentially saw five or six dark patterns. The obstruction dark pattern really did tick a lot of people off. It made them much more likely to express anger. It made them it put them in a worse mood, um, made them much more likely to drop out of the experiment. They also said they were less willing to do research with us uh, in uh, in the future. So if we try and translate our experimental results to sort of what is the reality of e-commerce, what I take away from our results is that there is a pretty strong business incentive not to employ aggressive dark patterns, not to throw dark pattern after dark pattern at, at your customers or potential customers. That will cause, I think, a lot of customers to just decide to take their business elsewhere. But if you just employ mild dark patterns, you just employ a couple, well, that seems to be all upside. There's no significant backlash from consumers, but you're more than doubling uh, the percentage of consumers who are likely to accept the offer you're uh, putting uh, in, in front of them. Um, and what's interesting about this mood data that I showed you earlier, I said, you know, people in the aggressive dark patterns condition tended to be ticked off. Uh, mathematically, this effect was entirely driven by people who rejected the data protection plan. People who accepted the data protection plan in the mild condition or in the aggressive dark patterns condition weren't actually uh, in any worse of a mood uh, than people who accepted in the control group, i.e. people who weren't exposed to any dark patterns at all. Okay, so we were really intrigued by this first set of results, um, but we wanted to go bigger. We realized that there were limitations on the first study because everyone who saw dark patterns saw them in the same order, saw them in the same sequence. There were some really popular kinds of dark patterns that we didn't test in the first experiment. So we launched experiment, experiment number two. Essentially, we doubled the size of the research population. Um, almost 3,800 Americans participated in this experiment. Again, this is gonna be a census-weighted group, so it looks just like the US adult online population in terms of all the uh, relevant demographics we're likely to care about. And in this instance, in experiment two, everyone was only going to see mild dark patterns. They were going to see one, zero, one, two, or a maximum of three dark patterns. No more than that. Essentially, no one's going to get an aggressive dark pattern thrown at them. Um, and uh, the other thing we did is we randomly varied the cost of the dark pattern. Uh, in the first uh, experiment, our, our data protection plan wasn't a terrible deal. In this experiment, we made, at least for uh, half the sample, we made it a really bad deal. There are commercial entities out there that charge customers for uh, data protection plans. Now, the most expensive one that I could find on the market was 30 bucks a month. Um, so we randomly assigned people to either pay $9 a month or $39 a month for this um, hypothetical uh, data protection plan that we told them we were signing them up for. And we wanted to see 
you know, how much do, of a difference do dark patterns make compared to massive price differentials? And so in terms of understanding the experiment, we essentially randomly assigned people to one of these um, 20 boxes. We're gonna uh, test out some dark patterns that are focused on the content of the communication and some that are focused on the form of the communication. And then we'll be able to tell you, you know, which are the dark patterns that are most and least effective and whether there are any particular combinations of dark patterns that are especially potent. So I'll just show you uh, a little bit about what the different dark patterns looked like. Um, in addition to the control group, we had four uh, dark patterns that were focused on content. One of them you can think of as a fine print dark pattern. We're telling them about the free part in big print. We're telling them about the cost part once the free trial is over in smaller print that's less um, visually prominent. We're doing a social proof dark pattern. We're telling them how many people just like them have signed up for the data protection plan in the last couple of weeks. We ran a scarcity dark pattern. You've got to act now. This uh, offer will expire in 60 seconds, um, so get a move on. And we tried a confirm shaming dark pattern, forcing people if they wanted to decline the data protection plan to say things that they're uh, in fact quite unlikely to uh, believe. So those were the content dark patterns we tried. We also used these um, form-based uh, uh, dark patterns. Um, uh, the control group just saw a neutral decision between accept and uh, decline, but the dark patterns folks uh, were randomly assigned to boxes that might cause them to see accept pre-selected by default. They could unclick that, but it was going to take uh, that tiny little bit of extra effort. Um, we could mark the accept the plan as the recommended option, similar to experiment one, or we could try an obstruction dark pattern that gave them a choice between accept and other options. It was just going to make them uh, click through uh, one or potentially two additional screens if they wanted to decline the plan, but they could accept it uh, right away. And for half of the sample, they also saw a very confusing double negative prompt. Um, would you prefer not to decline this free data protection and credit history monitoring? Again, that's imposing a pretty he heavy cognitive demand on people, um, a double negative that might lead people to becoming confused. Okay, so what were the results of experiment two? If something's not highlighted in yellow, it's not statistically significant, meaning it's not meaningfully different from the control group. But if something's highlighted in yellow, that means that um, the differences we're seeing are very unlikely to be uh, caused by random chance. So interestingly, that scarcity dark pattern, if you don't act within 60 seconds, this deal disappears, that actually didn't increase acceptance rates. Um, uh, caused them to drop, though not in a statistically significant way. But the three other forms of content-based dark patterns all significantly boosted acceptance rates. So the confirmed shaming strategy is boosting that acceptance rate from um, just under 15% to just under 20%. Uh, social proof, look at how many other people have signed up for this program, gets a, gives a bigger boost acceptance rate all the way up to 22.1%. And look at what hidden information or fine print is doing. All by itself, that one dark pattern is more than doubling the acceptance rate. 14.8% becomes 30.1% just with that single dark pattern. What about the form-based dark patterns? Here again, actually labeling something the recommended option to my surprise did not significantly increase the acceptance rate but making something the default choice did and obstructing, making it harder to say no than to say yes, making you click through an additional screen, that um, caused a much uh, bigger uh, boost in the acceptance rates. And so if we put these two uh, form and content conditions together, we can actually show you how these different mixes of dark patterns work together, right? So we can tell you that um, uh, if you, uh, you know, just do obstruction alone, you're going to match up uh, the control uh, on the left with obstruction on the top. That by itself is going to boost the acceptance rate from 13.2% to 19.5%. But look at what you can do by uh, mixing together two potent dark patterns. If you just hide the information a little bit, putting it in fine print, and you make people click through one additional screen, your acceptance rate just from those two mild dark patterns will go from 13.2% upper left all the way up to 34.5% uh, 
uh, in the in the lower white right quadrant. And so looking and at, looking at this data in the aggregate can tell us social scientists that some of these dark patterns seem to backfire and not be especially effective, but some of them can be extraordinarily effective at converting people who are inclined to say no into yeses. Um, the other dark pattern that was uh, again shockingly potent was that double negative. So the double negative question um, uh, that I showed you just a little a little bit ago, um, all by itself, doubled the acceptance rate of our program from 16.7% all the way up to 33.4%. And this is an instance where I think we can be supremely confident that consumers are worse off. How do we know that? Well, in the debrief for, or just before the debrief for experiment two, we asked our subjects whether they had accepted or rejected the data protection plan. And fully half of our subjects who actually accepted the data protection plan on this double negative screen insisted that they had rejected the plan. In other words, we had bamboozled them into um, uh, legally saying yes, even though they understood that they were saying no. And obviously with doubling, these results are going to be highly significant. Um, and the other thing that was really interesting about this finding, the more people, the more time people spent on the double negative screen, the worse their mood and the less likely they were to do research with us in the future. So I'm showing you that these dark patterns really matter in manipulating people who want to say no into saying yes. What doesn't matter? The price doesn't matter. So remember I told you we randomly varied whether people were going to be charged $9 a month or $39 a month once the, once the one month free trial was over. And boosting the price, the monthly cost of the subscription by $30 did not significantly affect the acceptance rate. So that's a pretty mind blowing result to me. What are the things that really matter as consumers um, sort of make their way through the economy and engage in economic activity. We're supposed to think that price drives decisions, um, and it does to a certain extent, but here the effects of price are swamped by the manipulative effects of these uh, dark patterns. Um, why is that? People, as our data suggests, are highly optimistic that they'll cancel once the free trial period uh, ends. Um, in our experiment, experiment two, we replicated a couple of the really important findings in experiment one, uh, in addition to the ones I've already showed you. Uh, people, there was no backlash at all uh, that showed up in our data. In fact, some of the dark patterns actually uh, put people in a better mood rather than a worse mood, like hiding information about the price, making it less visually prominent. And here again, the dark patterns were much more successful at boosting acceptance rates among less educated Americans than they were at boosting acceptance among college graduates um, or people uh, with uh, graduate uh, degrees. Um, so uh, what I take away from our experiments are several points. If you remember nothing else about the research, I would say try and remember uh, these things. First, it's mild dark patterns that are most insidious because they'll substantially boost acceptance or agreement um, without generating a meaningful customer backlash. These dark patterns do tend to prey on less educated subjects. More highly educated people have built up more effective defense mechanisms against dark patterns. Uh, dark patterns seem to um, be more important than price in affecting whether people are signing up for certain kinds of services or products. Um, but you don't wanna talk about dark patterns with a one size fits all. Some of these dark patterns are extremely effective. Some of them don't seem to be effective at all, at least um, uh, if our research is externally valid. And so as Jen said, these dark patterns seem to be proliferating because of extensive A-B testing inside firms. Um, before we did our research, a lot of people had run experiments like this, but they had just presumably kept the results proprietary. And you know, hopefully our contribution is to share those kinds of results um, with the world. So that's all I have to say as a social scientist. I think I've got like three minutes left. So let me just put on my legal scholar hat for those uh, remaining uh, concluding uh, remarks. And I just wanna leave you with sort of two points as a lawyer, as a law professor. Um, the first is that it's a mistake, I think, to view the category of dark patterns as uh, completely overlapping 
with the category of fraud. Dark patterns and fraud are both problematic. Um, uh, and some forms of dark patterns are fraudulent, but not all of them are. And second, um, I want to leave you with uh, an idea about how regulators might go about um, restricting the use of dark patterns in a way that'll be comprehensible to firms, transparent, in a way that uh, doesn't um, uh, give nasty surprises to people who have to do the hard work of designing websites or designing uh, apps, okay? So the first point I think is straightforward. If we think about the, taxon the taxonomy of dark patterns uh, that Jen introduced at the outset, some of them are certainly fraudulent, um, hidden information or sneaking items into your cart. But a lot of dark patterns are kind of in a gray area involving fraud or don't involve fraud at all. Uh, it's not fraudulent to obstruct someone's um, decision to reject an offer. It's not fraudulent to nag them, to come at them every two weeks until they say yes. Um, it's not, I don't think, fraudulent to employ these manipulative and loaded phrases uh, like uh, confirm shaming. And what I've done here is I've highlighted those dark patterns that our results suggest are particularly potent. And what you'll see is some of them are very comfortably going to fit into the category of fraud, but some of them uh, really don't. Um, and so fraud should be banned. Fraud should be unlawful. Fraud is bad for consumers. Um, but there are some kinds of manipula manipulation that we see online that are very hard to put into the fraudulent box, but still ought to be a great concern for those of us who care about uh, consumer uh, uh, welfare. Of course, CPRA, the language uh, that this body is charged with interpreting, it doesn't include fraud as an element of dark patterns. So I think it would be a mistake to read into the statute uh, something that uh, is not there. And then finally, my last point is um, I want to advocate what I'll call the symmetry principle for dark patterns. If there's a grand unifying theme uh, that characterizes nearly all dark patterns, maybe all dark patterns, it's a kind of asymmetry, it's a kind of weighted dice or kind of stacked deck. Um, and this is, I think, an idea that both California and the Federal Trade Commission have already uh, recognized. So if you look at the, uh, the CCPA regulations, they build the ones that are already uh, promulgated. Uh, California has already built a kind of symmetry principle into the existing regulatory framework. Um, if you want to opt out of information sharing, that shouldn't be harder than um, opting than opting in. The Federal Trade Commission, in guidance, it recently gave on negative option marketing, which is like when you um, uh, infer from a consumer's inaction that they wish to proceed with a transaction. That's what negative option marketing means. Um, so too, the Federal Trade Commission has said to firms, cancellation mechanisms need to be at least as easy to use as the method the consumer used to initiate the negative option feature. In other words, it's got to be as easy to cancel as it was to sign up, it's got to be as easy to say no as it is to say yes. Okay, so I think of that as a really appealing principle for how to regulate dark patterns. And let me show you a little bit more of what I mean by that. I think firms should be allowed to ask a consumer, are you sure you want to say no? So long as if a consumer says yes, they also see the same are you sure prompt. Um, I think it ought to be okay to go back to a consumer who said no one month later and say, are you sure you wanna um, disable location tracking? I think that's fine, provided that that same firm also goes back to consumers one month later and says to consumers who said, yes, I'll, I'll permit location tracking to also reconsider their view and now to opt out. The problem is dark patterns will only nag you if you say no to location tracking. And if you say yes, they're gonna leave you alone. That's the choice that the app designer wanted you to make. And so they'll stop making it easy for you to change your mind. So I think my view is you wanna make it hard for people to say no, that's fine. Make it hard for them to say yes. And there's no problematic asymmetry. There's not a dark pattern in my view. And you can think about this basic approach as applied to the other kinds of dark patterns that are most problematic. Confirm shaming is problematic because it's using manipulative language to make a seeming choice between two options actually be no uh, choice 
at all. So think about all these ballot propositions that are gonna be on the California ballot. Are you in favor of this bond initiative to support your local public schools? Or do you prefer that your local public schools crumble uh, and that the poor kids um, have to deal with you know, asbestos and falling ceiling tiles? Well, gee, when you put it that way, I'll vote for the bond initiative, but that's not a fair choice to present to voters. And similarly, um, designers of user interfaces ought not to be allowed to present those kinds of choices to consumers and then pretend like consumers are uh, freely uh, consenting. And you know, lastly, I think this example works really well for social proof. It's fine to tell people that 1,647 people accepted the data protection plan, so long as you tell them that 3,419 rejected it. In other words, there's nothing misleading or manipulative about saying three out of five dentists recommend this uh, mouthwash. But if you tell people the numerator, without telling them the denominator, that's more problematic. And similarly, and I think this is the last symmetry principle about information that's probably um, the trickiest to operationalize, but um, a dark pattern that presents all the benefits of signing up for a service while burying information about the costs, it's also introducing a uh, substantial asymmetry. So if consumers are likely to view the good aspects of the product, as, uh, as material as the bad aspects or the downsides or the costs, then it's easy to imagine a regulatory uh, intervention that simply requires uh, symmetry and something that looks more like full information. And so I wanna be very clear about what, what I am and what I'm not advocating here. Um, you have to make, as a user experience designer, you have to make hard choices. Some choices are gonna be really prominent and consumers will see them right away. Some of them, you may need to have people um, click through a number of screens on settings in order to undo them. The fact that it takes a few clicks to get to something isn't a problem if that thing that takes a few clicks is something that very few consumers are going to want to do. But if you know the stuff that consumers want to do and you're putting up a whole bunch of unnecessary obstacles in the path of the consumer, who wants to effectively exercise that choice, that's where uh, the dark pattern uh, kicks in. And so our view is it's fine to obstruct or impede or hide stuff that's really unpopular, but it's the popular stuff when you're obstructing or hiding or impeding that, that you get yourselves into a lot of trouble, perhaps a kind of trouble that the law ought to have something to say about. So if you're interested in learning uh, more about this topic or in seeing all of the underlying data that I presented in the social science -y, uh, portion of the talk, um, uh, please uh, feel free to check out uh, the paper I did with Jamie Liguori, uh, Shining a Light on Dark Patterns, um, Google, uh, Bing, or any other search engine will uh, take you there. And thank you so much. Many thanks to Professor Strahilovitz and Dr. King for those incredibly informative presentations. We really appreciate it. Um, it's 2.08. We have um, two more presentations this afternoon. So I'm going to call for a 10 minute break so everyone can sort of shake out a little bit and um, clear their heads to be ready for um, the next presentation. Uh, it is 2.08 on my clock now, so we'll reconvene at 2.18 p.m. for the rest of this afternoon's presentations. And again, thank you very much.
Good afternoon, Mr. Gorley. I think we are ready to start up again. If you want to take the slide down, thank you. And are we still recording? Uh, yes, Chairperson Urban, uh, we are ready if you're ready. Wonderful, perfect, thank you so much. And welcome back everyone from our short break to the California Privacy Protection Agency's March 2022 pre-rulemaking informational sessions. As you just heard us discuss, we are recording. Um, we're listening to a series of presentations under agenda item two, an overview of personal information in the California Consumer Privacy Act. Just to give you a roadmap, um, we have two more presentations this today, and then we'll finish the day with public comment. And I'll remind everybody how to engage in public comment when we get there. Uh, so we'll now continue with our first set of informational presentations. If you're following along on the agenda, we're on day one, agenda item two, part D, business and consumer interactions, communicating business practices and consumer preferences. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker on this topic, Professor Loy Craner, who will be discussing her work on communications between consumers and businesses related to privacy. Professor Lori Faith Craner, is the director and Bosch Distinguished Professor of the Scilab Security and Privacy Institute and the Four Systems Professor of Computer Science and of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. She is also the co-director of the Collaboratory Against Hate Research and Action Center. She directs the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory, known as CUPS, and co-directs the MSIT Privacy Engineering Master's Program. In 2016, she served as the Chief Technologist for the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. She co-founded Wombat Security Technologies, and she is a fellow of the ACM, the IEEE, AAAS, and a member of the ACM Chai Academy, or Chai Academy, excuse me. Um, Professor Craner, um, I'm delighted to turn things over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, let me go ahead and share my slides here. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So um, let me jump in here. Um, there are a few topics that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to, uh, in general, talk about different types of privacy interfaces and usability and user testing uh, that can be done with them. Uh, we're going to talk about privacy policies and alternatives very briefly, um, then um, privacy icons, privacy nutrition labels and tools, privacy choice interfaces, and then go over some takeaways. And I think um, I, you know, I listened uh, to the last set of presentations and uh, a lot of the things that I have to say, I think resonate a lot with what you've already heard um, today. Okay. So uh, you've all probably uh, read a lot of privacy policies or more likely glanced at them and decided not to read a lot of privacy policies. Uh, and uh, people really can't be blamed for not going ahead and reading privacy policies because they're very long. Um, in fact, they're, they're so long that if you were to go ahead and read all the privacy policies that you encountered on websites, you would likely be spending 244 hours per year in order to do that. Uh, this is based on a study that I conducted with Alicia McDonald in 2008, um, so that, that's a while ago. Um, but uh, based on what we've been seeing, uh, things haven't really gotten any better since then. Um, and if anything, uh, I would suspect that if we recalculated uh, the numbers today, um, the number might even actually have gone up. So we've been looking at what can we do instead of having these long uh, privacy policies. And while in some sense we may need them for legal reasons, uh, these aren't necessarily the best way of communicating with the public. Uh, so we might you know, somewhere uh, on a website have the privacy policy documented, but the, uh, the information that we wanna to show to people might be um, provided in a more user-friendly way. Uh, so we looked at, you know, what is the, the design space? What are the choices of different ways that we could provide privacy information to people? And there are a lot of different um, uh, uh, approaches that you can take. And this is kind of a, you know, a mix and match here. 
Uh, you can play with the timing. Uh, do you actually pop something up, you know, at setup when when you uh, get a new device, when you go to a new website, when you start a new program? Uh, do you instead uh, show information just in time when you're prompting people to type in information? Maybe then you tell them about the privacy practices just for that particular information. Uh, maybe it's context dependent. Uh, the information that you provide depends on what services someone is using, what part of a website they're visiting. Uh, maybe it's periodic. Once a month, you get a notification. Maybe it's persistent, like the icon that you uh, might have um, in a mobile app to show that location is being shared and kind of sits in the corner of your screen. Um, or maybe this is information that is only provided on demand when a user specifically clicks on a link in order to access it. Uh, we can also look at you know, what channel do we convey this in. Uh, if I'm using a laptop or a phone, then it's likely that that privacy information is going to be on that primary channel, my screen. But if I'm interacting with an IoT device, say a smart light bulb or a smart thermostat, there might not be a screen where we can actually provide any privacy information. Um, but generally, these sorts of devices are synced to another device, usually a phone, and we can provide information there. And then sometimes I'm interacting with the device or just passively walking by a device in a public space. Uh, and so a sign on the wall might be the most appropriate way uh, to provide me with private privacy information. Uh, we can also think about modality. Uh, generally, we're thinking about visuals, things that we read, symbols that we look at, uh, but we can also have auditory notices, such as the kinds we get when we call an 800 number and we're told this call may be re recorded, right? That, that's a privacy notice. Um, we can have things that vibrate. Uh, and my favorite is that we can have information in a machine readable format, uh, which would be then conveyed to each user's device, which could then convey it to the user in a way that's most accessible to them. Uh, we also sometimes have privacy notices that are blocking. You can't move forward until you actually take a look at them or at least click to acknowledge that you've looked at them. Some of them are non-blocking. Some of them are unrelated to your interaction uh, with a device or a website. Uh, they're just sort of sitting there on the side uh, for you to look at. Here are some examples of ways that uh, different organizations have conveyed privacy information outside of those long privacy policies. Uh, so you can see um, uh, Apple and iOS now has um, app privacy labels in their app store, and that's kind of a, a shorter version of a privacy notice. It uses a lot of symbols, um, and it, and it uh, distills it down to uh, some very basic facts. Um, we've seen game companies that turn their privacy notice into to a game. Uh, this makes it fun and intriguing. Um, I'm not sure it's the best way to actually convey information, though. Uh, we've seen um, a lot of companies have uh, put videos um, on their website. Sometimes they embed them in the privacy policy. And typically, these are very short, like 30 seconds to talk about a specific privacy concept that's in their privacy policy. And then we've had a lot of work uh, with icons, which, which I'm going to talk about. So let's start with icons. Uh, there's been uh, some, some really interesting work in designing privacy icons. Um, and there's been some, some great designers have worked on the problems. Um, these two icon sets that I'm showing you, I think are, are very attractive um, and really, really nice icons. Um, but the problem with them is that unless you see the words next to them, it's actually fairly difficult to figure out what they mean. Um, most of them are not particularly intuitive. And um, because there are so many of them, it would be difficult to, uh, to have people you know, learn over time what they mean. And we, we, we can all learn an icon or two, um, but you know, when you have a dozen icons, uh, that does get difficult. And part of the reason why uh, privacy icons are so difficult is because privacy is kind of an amorphous concept. It, it doesn't lend itself well to a physical representation that I could draw an icon of. Um, and so, uh, you know, the solution, if you want to use icons, is to put words next to them, uh, hopefully succinct words next to them, uh, that make it more clear as to what this is showing. 
Now you may wonder, well, if you have to put words next to them, why even bother with the icons? And what we've seen is that there, there is a, a role for icons um, because, um, because the icons can help uh, pe attract people's attention to things. Uh, you can glance at something and see the icon. Uh, and so there is a role and they can be helpful, uh, but by themselves, privacy icons are not always that useful. So here's uh, perhaps one of the most common privacy icons that, that uh, you may have seen, this uh, triangle, blue triangle with a little eye in it, um, which is uh, known as the Ad Choices icon. Um, and it was developed by, by the US advertising industry. Um, and uh, this has been uh, deployed uh, for over a decade now. And when it first came out, uh, we decided to do some research in our lab at Carnegie Mellon to see whether people recognized it, what they understood about it. And we did a small study and we discovered that nobody had any idea what it was. They didn't recognize it and they were afraid to actually click on it. Um, and so we did a larger study to see, was it just you know, the, the small, people, small number of people in Pittsburgh who came to our lab or was this a, a bigger problem? Uh, so we did this online using the crowdsourcing service, Amazon Mechanical Turk, and we had over 1500 uh, participants. And um, we showed these participants uh, this icon and we varied the tagline. So usually when you see it, either there are no words next to it or you have the words ad choices. Uh, but sometimes you see other taglines such as, why did I get this ad? Um, and so we wanted to see whether people understood it without a tagline and whether the different taglines would, would make a difference. So we showed people an ad with, um, with the icon and uh, a tagline or not. Um, and then we asked them questions like, what would happen if you clicked on the icon? And then we gave them a number of choices and they could tell us how likely uh, they thought it was that each of these things might happen. So more than half the people told us that it was likely that more ads would pop up. And, and that's incorrect. That will not happen if you click on the ad choices icon. Uh, almost half the people thought it was kind of a your ads here sort of thing. If you wanna buy an ad, you should click on the ad icon. And that's also incorrect. Uh, so only 27% of people had the correct answer, which is that this will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. Um, so that was the results we found when we put the word ad choices next to this icon. However, as I mentioned, we tried a bunch of other taglines. And the one that we found was most successful was configure ad preferences. When we showed configure ad preferences, actually 50% of the people um, realized the correct answer. Now you can see we still had a lot of misconceptions, so this is not a perfect solution, uh, but it is by far better than the solution of putting ad choices next to it. Um, and uh, we published these results a decade ago. Um, nonetheless, uh, we still see that usually ad choices is the term that's next to it. Uh, and this is also from an industry that does a lot of A-B testing um, and could probably come up with something even better uh, than what we came up with. All right, so the next uh, icon that I wanna talk about is the icon for the CCPA. Um, so uh, when uh, the CCPA legislation came out, um, my students in my lab at Carnegie Mellon, um, even though we're in Pittsburgh, we're not in California, but we, we, uh, we read it. And uh, we noticed that there was a provision to have a button or logo that would sit next to the do not sell my personal information link. Um, so we were curious about that and uh, found out that there had been nothing proposed. Um, and so we decided to try to come up with something ourselves uh, within the 90 day public comment period. Uh, so we didn't just want to come up with an icon, though. We wanted to actually test it and find out if it was any good before we proposed it to the attorney general. Uh, so there was a lot of work to do, um, but my students are great. And uh, we did actually do all of this within 90 days. So we came up with icons. We did a preliminary evaluation. We refined the most promising icons. 
we tested the refined icons. Um, then because we, we knew from past experience how important the text was, uh, and we weren't so sure that the text that's in the legislation was the best, uh, we decided to test some other text. Um, and uh, then we combined the icons and the text, um, and we submitted um, our comments uh, during the 90-day public comment period. Um, we later actually collected some more data and wrote a paper about it, which, which is uh, also published and it's on our website. Okay, so uh, this was the ideation phase. We actually had some workshops um, uh, at Carnegie Mellon and with our collaborators at the University of Michigan, um, where we asked people to think about what how, how would you convey do not sell my personal information? What, what visuals come in mind, come to mind? And people sat there with stacks of post-it notes and markers and came up with ideas. These weren't designers or artists. These were just everyday people and a lot of people who thought a lot about privacy uh, coming up with ideas. And there were three uh, general concepts that we noticed when we put them all on the whiteboard and rearranged them and said, you know, what, what do we have in common? So we had some people who tried to draw a picture that represented choices and consent. Um, other people tried to represent the concept of opting out. Opting out. And then we had people who tried to um, represent the concept of not selling. Those were the, I mean, there were a few others as well, but these were the main concepts that we saw. So we took these ideas and our badly drawn post-it notes and we gave them to some designers and had them try to actually polish these and make them look nice. Um, so here are um, our three favorites uh, related to choice and consent. Here we have opting out. Um, the, you'll notice the idea with opting out is that we have a box, a hole, and a folder, and we have the arrow showing that you're lifting something out of them. Um, at least that was, that was the, the plan of what we were trying to convey. Um, and then uh, we had uh, the icons that represented do not sell. And so we, you can see we have dollar signs uh, representing selling and then different ways of not selling with a slash or a do not enter or a stop sign uh, as well with that. Uh, we also uh, noticed that the, the advertising industry had put forward um, a green version of their blue icon um, and they claimed that uh, that would represent do not sell my personal information. Um, so we decided that we might as well test that as well. Okay, so for our first evaluation, um, we did this uh, again on, on, on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, this was a relatively small study with 240 participants. And we tested our 12 icons, both with and without the tagline, do not sell my personal information. So half the people saw that, half of them did not. Uh, each person saw one icon and we asked them what they thought the icon meant and what they thought would happen if you click on it. Then we showed them the whole set of 12 icons and we asked them which one do you think best conveys the idea of do not sell my personal information and which one best conveys the idea of privacy choices. So here's what we found. Uh, first of all, we found um, that uh, without the words, uh, people had a lot of trouble figuring out what any of these icons meant. Um, so the words, uh, as we'd seen earlier, the words were actually pretty important. Um, we found that uh, this uh, icon that looks sort of like a stylized toggle is what best conveyed the idea of choices about personal information. And this icon with a dollar sign and a slash was what best conveyed the idea of do not sell my personal information. But we also found um, very strongly that people thought it had something uh, to do with payments or no payments or no cash or no money or, or something like that. So it also had a lot of misconceptions associated with it. Uh, these opt out icons were mostly confusing to most people. Uh, they did not understand what we were trying to convey there. Um, we found that very few people recognized that this black octagon with a dollar sign was supposed to represent a stop sign. Um, maybe it was because it was black and not red. Um, I don't know, uh, but, but it, in any case, it didn't really work very well. Um, and we also found that people had really no clue about this green triangle. 
So uh, we, we decided to take uh, the two that seemed most promising uh, and refine them. Um, we were also curious whether if we made the stop sign red, whether that would actually help. So we, we decided to make it red and try that. Um, and we also uh, brought the green triangle along as well. And so we now had these colorized versions of these icons with some tweaks to them. And we did another evaluation. Um, and uh, so we, we did a similar study. And once again, we found um, that the, the dollar sign with the slash best conveyed do not sell my personal information, uh, didn't do a very good job of conveying the idea of choices. And we found that, uh, that the stylized toggle did a good job of conveying choices, but didn't do as good a job with do not sell my personal information. Um, and the other icons um, were, were not as good at anything. Uh, we also looked at the common interpretations of each of the icons. Uh, here were some of the most common things uh, that we saw. Uh, with the toggle, we saw a lot of correct interpretations. Now, they didn't address privacy specifically, but they did understand that it was related to activating, declining, deactivating, uh, those sorts of things. Um, the slash dollar, uh, unfortunately, we just saw a lot of associations with money, things being free, um, and we only uh, saw one person who had who understood that it meant selling is not allowed. Um, again, none of these uh, conveyed privacy specifically uh, in this case. Um, the green triangle, a lot of people thought it had to do with getting more information or that it was a play button for an audio or video player. Right. Then we did some ideation on taglines. So besides the do not sell my personal information and do not sell my info, which are in the um, regulation, uh, we also tested a bunch of other things that we thought had potential to uh, be better for consumers. Um, and uh, the top uh, ones from our testing um, were privacy choices, privacy options, and personal info choices. Then we did combo testing. So we tested um, three icons and five taglines plus no tagline. Uh, we also tested no icon. So we had four icon conditions six tagline conditions, four times six is 24. Uh, we did not test having no icon and no tagline because that would convey nothing. Um, so we did 23 uh, different conditions in our test. And uh, the way we tested them, again, this was on Mechanical Turk, but we wanted to put this in the context of a website. So we made up a footwear website um, and it, it looked like a typical um, e-commerce website and it had lots of you know, information on the bottom of the screen, um, privacy policies and um, uh, shipping policies and things like that. And we put at the bottom a, an icon and a tagline. And um, uh, in our study, each participant saw one of these conditions. So they had one of these 23 conditions indicated what combination they would see there. So we showed them that website and then we gave them a survey where uh, we gave them a close up so that they could make sure to see what this was. And we asked them, what do you think would happen if you clicked on this? So uh, once again, we saw a lot of misconceptions. Um, and because we had this in the context of a website this time, a lot of the misconceptions had to do with the website. So they thought that personal info had to do with shoe sizes, for example, um, and payment methods on, on the website. Um, we also saw that the slash dollar um, sometimes suggested to pe people things related to payment options or encrypted payments. Um, we saw that the toggle icon uh, usually didn't have misconceptions, but there were a small number of people who thought maybe it was a real toggle, not just a symbol um, related to, to being a stylized toggle. We found that none of the icons were very good without a tagline once again, and the slash dollar was especially bad when we didn't have a, tog a, a, a um, tagline. Um, we also found that if we had the taglines without the icons, it was fine. They didn't really have, uh, the icons didn't really have that much um, impact on the interpretation of the taglines. 
So based on this study, uh, we wrote our report and we recommended this blue stylized toggle icon. And we recommended putting the tagline privacy options next to it. Um, the idea here being that this would al allow consumers to look for one button for all their privacy related choices. Right? We don't really want to have uh, different privacy regulations for different specific things, both in California and around the world, um, where you know each regulation has a different icon, and you'd have like all these different icons. You'd have to click here for the California uh, opt out, and here for the Texas opt out, and here for Europe, and that didn't really make much sense. And we thought, well, if we could just have one icon, you could click and you get all your choices. Um, that would simplify things. Um, now that said, that's not what is actually in the legislation. And, and so of course you could also put this next to do not sell my personal information. Okay, so this is what we recommended. And uh, this is what the Office of the Attorney General put out um, for public comment uh, uh, shortly after um, we submitted our recommendations. And at first we looked at it and we said, okay, they have an icon that is also kind of a stylized toggle, uh, like what we suggested. We suggested blue, they suggested red, but yeah, you know, it's kind of similar. But then we started to think about it and we had some concerns. Um, we had specifically designed our stylized toggle not to look like a, re a real toggle to try to prevent the case where people would think that they should toggle it. Um, and by making it blue, we also tried to prevent people from trying to infer what state it was in. So seeing something red and something that looks a lot like a typical toggle that people see in iOS or on a website um, made us concerned that people would try to toggle it and that people would view the red coloring as inferring some sort of a state. Um, and there were other people who were concerned about this as well. We saw um, a lot of uh, tweets um, on Twitter where people uh, were, were uh, uh, complaining that they thought that this would be um, fairly confusing. So we decided to run another study and test what we had proposed against this new red icon. Um, while we were at it, we made another version of it that had a bigger X. Um, we thought it was more aesthetically pleasing. Um, and, uh, and then we decided, well, let's test ours in red and the other one uh, in blue as well. So we tested um, you know, six different versions of this. We found that the size of the X made very little difference. Um, but we did find that there was a big difference between what we had proposed and the red uh, icon that had been uh, proposed. Um, we found that um, the, the red one was much more likely to be misinterpreted as an actual toggle. And therefore people uh, said that they, they might not click on it because they were afraid of changing the state of things into something bad. Um, we found small differences based on color that, that turned out not to be that big a deal in this case. Um, so uh, a big takeaway, though, was that it was really important to do this test. Um, I think, you know, what had been proposed by the um, Attorney General's office seemed at first to be relatively small changes, but they actually made some big differences. Um, and so it was important to actually do the user study to find out what the impact would be. Uh, so as a result, um, the Attorney General's office removed um, the, the icon um, from the regulation and said they would come back to it later. Um, and we went ahead and tested some more icons. Uh, so we tested some variations on the ones we tested before and some others that, that had been suggested to us. Um, and this time we, we uh, made some changes to our study. Um, so we, uh, we also looked at whether any of the icons would help in communicating do not sell choices, whether it would help in standing out to users on a website, and whether they would help motivate users to actually click, which is you know, what we want people to do if they actually want to opt out, they're going to need to click on something. Um, and this time we also made sure that all of our participants were California residents. They were not for people from all over the US uh, since it's most relevant to California residents. So what did we find out? <laughs> we found out that we could communicate best if we had no icon. Uh, so that was kind of disappointing. Um, we also found that um, 
adding any icon, the good thing about it is that it made users more likely to notice the link. So it did help with standing out on the website, but it didn't create a significantly higher motivation to click on the link. So having any of these particular icons um, was hurting communication, but it was attracting attention. So this suggests to us that there's still some hope for icons, that, it, that having an icon can help you attract attention, but we need one that doesn't convey um, the wrong information. Um, and so perhaps we should revisit that icon that we tested earlier, which, which seemed to um, have fewer uh, misconceptions associated with it. And in fact, uh, that's eventually what the Attorney General's office did, and they uh, recommended our icon. So we were very excited. Our icon is now the uh, CCPA privacy options icon. Um, however, uh, you know, it's been a year or so and um, well, it hasn't really been adopted. Uh, I, I have been looking for it and um, I, I, I see it on my website. <laughs> That's about it. Um, so there's a question that if we want uh, this icon or any icon to be adopted if it is a voluntary icon, um, how do we actually incentivize adoption? Because um, it seems that uh, companies are not just, you know, on their own uh, deciding that they want to adopt it. Okay, let's talk about privacy nutrition labels and tools now. Uh, so there's been uh, a lot of discussion for probably about 20 years now where people have said, hey, we don't want to read these long privacy policies. Let's just make it so easy, like reading a nutrition label on a food wrapper where you can just glance at it and get information. Um, so um, uh, it, it, in about, I think we started working on this about 2007, 2008, um, my students started trying to figure out what that sort of design would look like for a privacy nutrition label. And we did um, focus groups, we did online testing, we did lab testing. Um, and this is uh, a design that we came up with that uh, tested well um, uh, in our studies. Um, and uh, you, you can read the papers about it if you want. Um, uh, this, this hasn't actually been adopted, um, another yeah, no adoption. But, um, but what we learned from this is that um, what's really important here is that it's succinct and it's standardized. So uh, you know, if, if every company comes up with their own nutrition label, that's not really very useful. What we need is them all to follow the same template. So you can put them side by side and you can compare them. And this makes it much easier for users to, um, to figure out what kinds of data is being collected and what is gonna be done with it. Okay. Um, we also looked at, could you do something even smaller than a label, um, some sort of like privacy meter? And if you had privacy meters, would people pay attention to them? Would they actually be attracted to websites that have you know, better privacy according to a privacy meter? Uh, so we developed a privacy meter for a search engine. Um, and we did a study where we had people come into our lab and some people were shown a search engine with no privacy meters, um, but it, it also had a price comparison. So you can see on the right side, we have, um, we have the prices with shipping for all these items. And on the left side, we have the privacy meter. So some people saw this, um, the search engine without the privacy meter, just, just the prices and you know, the prices influence their decisions. Um, and some people saw it with the privacy meter. Um, we, we also had some, some other variations uh, that we used as, as control conditions here. Um, but what we found was that um, when we did not show people a privacy meter, they would typically go for the cheapest site to make their purchases. And, and in this study, people actually did use their credit cards and actually made purchases. Uh, but when we showed them the privacy meter, then uh, we found that, that people were often influenced to pay a little bit more to shop at the website with better privacy. Um, we also uh, tried uh, some variations on this where we put the privacy meter in the header of a website or in an interstitial page. So you click on a link, you see the privacy meter, and then you click through to the website. And we found that if we took the privacy meter out of the search engine and put it somewhere else, that the effect went away. So it was most useful when it was right there when they were making the decision in the search engine about where they should click. Okay, here, here's an example of, of one of the, the uh, ways we tried that was not effective um, where we put it at, at the top of the page. 
So we've also looked at bank privacy policies and bank privacy policies were actually standardized um, through um, a collaboration of a whole bunch of US federal agencies who regulate the US financial sector. Uh, th this was done about a decade ago. Um, and so uh, every US bank you go to now, uh, pretty much they have their privacy policy in a format that looks like this. Um, the colors vary, the fonts vary, but, but it, it's basically this sort of a format and you can actually put them side by side and compare them. Um, one problem though, is you, know, you go into a bank and you look at their policy or you go to their website, you look at their policy. And if you don't like it, um, then you know, how do you find a bank that has a policy that you do like? Uh, this becomes a very long and iterative process. Um, so what we decided to do was to crawl the web, find these policies, screen scrape them all, put them in a big database and make it searchable. So now you can type in your zip code and find banks near you and compare their privacy policies very easily. Uh, we did this as a prototype. We're not actually maintaining this as a service. So you can try it on our website, um, but uh, it's not up to date at this point, but it's, it's a proof of concept. Uh, and, and this basically demonstrates the power of once you have standardized information, uh, this allows you to make useful tools for users. Uh, even better if the standardized information is in a computer readable format uh, so that um, it makes it very easy to build these tools. All right, here's another uh, privacy nutrition label. This one's actually for privacy and security. Uh, this is a project we did at Carnegie Mellon to develop a uh, label for IoT devices. Um, the idea is this would be on the packaging of an IoT device or on a website that's selling IoT devices. And we, uh, we did some studies with experts to find out what information we should put on them. And experts had a lot of information, um, especially about security that they thought should be on these labels. Um, so what we did is we took what we thought was most important for consumers, we put it in the version that's on the left. Um, that's the nice uh, succinct version. And then we put a link and a QR code uh, that you could scan to get the detailed version for experts. Um, and what we found in our user studies is that this is actually very helpful to consumers. Um, and we tested to see like consumers handle this, can they understand this information? And we found for the most part that consumers did have an idea of which devices would be more or less risky for them to purchase and deploy in their homes uh, based on the information. Um, and you know, we found some things that were less clear to consumers and, and we've uh, gone ahead and, and worked on trying to reword to, to make it uh, better uh, for, for consumers. Um, then once we had uh, that label, again, we had the question of, all right, so the consumer finds their uh, you know, smart thermostat or smart do doorbell and it's not good on privacy or security. How do they find a better one? And how can they do this comparison shopping? So this is a prototype of an app that you could uh, run on your phone, which, uh, which would let you uh, do the comparisons. But in this case, there's a lot of information. And so we set this up so that consumers can indicate which aspects they care most about. That's their priority settings. Um, they can set their preferences for what is acceptable for each of the priority settings. And then they get a device comparison where here you see two devices side by side um, and it lights up in red, which ones don't match their preferences and in white, those that do. Uh, and so you can more easily compare um, these devices without having to try to like put these policies all side by side on your small computer screen or on your phone screen, which would be impossible. Um, if you took this and then integrated it with a search engine, you'd have something even more useful. Okay, here's a, a project that we did um, about 10 years ago to develop an app uh, nutrition label uh, for the Android app store. Uh, we developed this privacy facts uh, and we wanted to test it with consumers to see whether it would actually help people choose apps and consider privacy. Um, and so here we, we came up with the idea of uh, inviting people to our lab and asking them to help a friend who has a new smartphone choose some apps. And we gave them a list of the types of apps that, um, that their friend wanted, a word game, a diet app, a travel app, things like that. Um, and then we gave them our uh, mocked up version of the app store where they uh, could choose 
from two of each type of app that their friend was interested in. Half the people saw our app store with privacy facts and half of them saw it without privacy facts. And what we found is that those who saw the, the um, app store without privacy facts had all sorts of reasons for their selections, but none of them had anything to do with privacy. But those who saw privacy facts were much more likely to say, oh, I chose this one because it's better for privacy. But privacy wasn't everything. Um, we saw cases where uh, they actually did not choose the more privacy protective one. And those were generally cases where they said, hey, I have used this app. I know this brand. I think it's great. Um, or look, this one has five stars. The more privacy protective one only has two stars. I'm going to go with the five stars. So privacy is not everything. But when you have that information, uh, we found that people were actually able to use it. So as I mentioned, this is, this is a research we did about a decade ago. Fast forward 10 years, finally, Apple comes out with an app privacy nutrition label um, for the iOS store. And Android um, uh, is supposed to be coming out with uh, something similar next month. Um, so we were really excited to see this actually deployed um, and uh, have, have started doing some research to see, is this actually useful? Um, our initial studies with iOS um, suggest that there's a lot of confusing terminology in what has been deployed, unfortunately, um, a lot of confusing definitions. And so we've done studies with um, app developers and found that the app developers are having trouble filling this out accurately, which means that some of these labels probably are wrong. They're not actually reflecting what's going on because the developers don't understand how to fill them out. Uh, and we have a paper on that that, that is uh, coming out um, and we already have it on our website. Um, we, we also uh, did a study with consumers, um, which we're, we're still um, writing up. And um, with consumers, we also saw similar things where consumers were confused by some of the terminology. Uh, we haven't yet uh, delved into the Android version yet, um, but basically, you know, the big takeaway here is I think Privacy nutrition labels for apps are still a great idea, but I think they do need um, some extensive testing, both with users and developers, to make sure we have something that is going to be understandable and usable. Okay, um, let's take a look at privacy choice interfaces. Um, so these are everywhere, and we, in, in the previous presentations today, have already heard about some of them. These include cookie banners, um, audience controls on social media, uh, the app permissions, third-party advertising controls, marketing opt-outs, and then, of course, CCPA and GDPR um, rights uh, interfaces. So what makes these interfaces usable? Uh, so we've done some work to try to identify some specific usability features that, um, that we might want to look for and evaluate for. Um, and so here, here's our list. First of all, it should meet users' needs. It should actually give people the choices that they want. Um, it should require minimal user effort. Um, it should make users aware of the fact that choices actually exist and where to find them. Uh, it should be comprehensible to convey choices and their implications so that users understand them. Um, it should do all of this in a way that the users are satisfied with the interface and they trust it. Um, it should be uh, done in a way that users uh, can change their mind, and if they um, and if they make a mistake, that they can fix their errors. Um, and it shouldn't nudge users towards the less privacy protective options. Um, it shouldn't have dark patterns. Okay, so uh, we've seen uh, lots of bad interfaces and. Uh, in the previous presentations, there were lots of examples of this. Um, you know, here's, here's an example uh, similar to what you've already seen this afternoon of a toggle that it's not quite clear what state the toggle is in and what would happen if you toggled it the other way. Um, we've also seen um, uh, in our research that you know, many of these uh, interfaces, if you want to find this toggle, you have to scroll, 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 scroll all the way to the bottom of the screen and find a little tiny link. Um, they're not at the top of the screen. They're not floating where, where you would find them. Um, uh, and um, we find that they're all different. They're not standardized. You learn how to use one. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to use another one. 
Um, and even when they use a standardized platform, because there are a small number of companies that actually sell um, the interface components to websites they can use so that they can you know, just deploy these choices without having to code it up themselves. So you would think this is like fairly standardized, but what we've seen is that the standardized platforms offer many choices, lots of flexibility to websites. And so the end result is that they all do things differently and we don't actually have that standardization for users. Okay, so um, my, uh, my colleague Eleanor Burrell at Pomona um, and her students um, have, uh, have done some user studies testing several CCPA opt-out user interface variations. Uh, they have a paper on this that you, you should check out. Um, and um, basically what they found, um, not surprisingly, you know, based on what we've seen in other research is that how you design this interface makes a huge difference on opt-out rates. Um, if you just give people one big do not sell my information button, you get many more people clicking it than if you give people multiple buttons or you give people a button and a link. Um, and uh, you know they have to, if they wanna um, do not sell, then they have to go and click on the link. And um, so all of these things make a difference. Um, one of the things that, um, that Eleanor Burrell and her students did to try to make this better for users was to say, well, what if you didn't have to go look for that link in the bottom of the page and figure out what it means? Um, and so they developed a plugin, which is available as a Chrome extension, and you can search for it in the Chrome web store, um, that will automatically find that link for you on the page and make this little widget. And you don't have to scroll down. It's just going to sit in the corner of your screen, and there's one button there. Do not sell my personal information, all you have to do is click it. Um, and so that, that's an interesting kind of standardized approach where, all right, the websites aren't going to be standardized. Okay, well, we'll put something on top of that that makes it standard um, with, with this widget. You could also imagine that a browser company could even build that into their browser. Um, speaking of building the browser, um, another approach is global privacy control. Um, again, the idea is to let your browser be your privacy agent. You can set once what your preference is about opting out, and your browser could then send that signal to websites. Um, we don't have universal adoption of this. Um, in fact, we don't have a lot of adoption of this yet. Um, but this is this is something that hopefully going forward will have another easy way um, for users to access this. Um, also think it's important because uh, users may not know uh, whether or not uh, a website uh, respects their, their um, opt-out signal is to have some sort of an indicator in the browser to indicate, yes, this website has accepted your opt-out signal or this one has not. Uh, another tool that was developed uh, by my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon um, was a, a tool that would look for all kinds of opt-outs, not just CCPA on websites. And uh, again, this is a browser plugin and it finds all the opt-outs for you. And then you can go through and choose which ones uh, you would like to opt out of. This is called opt-out easy. Okay, let's take a look um, at cookie banners. And we've already heard uh, some of this and I'm a little short on time. So I'm gonna um, go through uh, some of this uh, quickly. Um, there are a lot of problems with common cookie banners that we see. Uh, they have defaults which, um, which are not uh, privacy protective, that they, that they in fact often default to the least privacy protective option and, um, and are fairly confusing. Um, they uh, require you to check multiple places to know what you're confirming. You know, this example here, um, we can confirm my choices, but I only actually see on the screen one of the choices that I'm confirming. And I would have to actually go through um, four different tabs uh, before I knew what I was actually confirming. Uh, sometimes they have no choices, which is kind of pointless. Um, sometimes they do that confirm shaming thing we, we talked about, you know, this is an example of an organic food store and, um, you know, they, they are, uh, uh, kind of misleading you in a way by, by talking about, you know, the quality of their organic ingredients. Oh, wait, what does that have to do with these cookies? You know, they're, it may be that they're the cookies they sell in their store are organic, but that doesn't make any sense when we talk about web cookies. 
uh, we see that even when you use the um, consent management platforms uh, that we have this problem. So here um, are two banners that we generated ourselves. We used one of the consent management platforms and we generated this with the platform. Um, and the platform is happy to allow you to generate either, a, either approach uh, for your website. Um, the one on the top, we have a button that says accept all cookies and it's bold. And there's a link to edit cookie preferences. And if you click the link, then you have to go through more uh, clicks and links in order to get the preferences that you want. A better approach, I think, is that you put the choices right there on the screen. So we have accept all cookies, but just as easy is I can accept only necessary cookies. Um, and if I'd like to do something more fine grained, then I can click edit cookie preferences and go decide exactly which, which uh, cookies that I want. Um, and so, you know, ideally we would have some nudging of web developers to say, do this one, um, don't do the one with just the link, even though the cookie management platforms make that really easy to do. All right, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about a study that we did evaluating different cookie banners and, uh, and what the impact of them was. Um, so we started by taking a look at about 200 websites and looking to see what were the popular um, things that were being done. And then we uh, developed 12 different variations of the same cookie consent banner. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to skip over this. And all right, here, here is our... Um, uh, website. We, we designed a website called Cups and Such. It sells cups and drinkware. Um, and we invited people to come test out this website. And we asked them to find some cups they were interested in buying and put them in their, in their cart. And then we would uh, give them a survey. And um, in the survey, we, we uh, asked them some questions about um, the cookie consent that, oh, by the way, that popped up while they were on the website. Uh, then we had them go back and look at it more carefully and answer some more questions. Uh, we had over a thousand participants in the study. Um, unfortunately, uh, it turned out that most of them were young women. We did not have a very diverse sample in this case. Um, and we're, we're actually uh, working on doing this study again to test a bunch of things, but in part to have a more diverse sample. Okay, so uh, this was one of the variations that we tested. Um, and this is, we called it best practices. Um, you, you could probably do better, but this was the best of the ones that we tested. Uh, this has um, uh, a fully blocking design. So you have to interact with it. It doesn't just sit in the corner. Um, it shows you in line, all of the cookie options right there. You don't have to click through. Um, it has bulleted text rather than a big paragraph, uh, and it has detailed button text. So it doesn't, doesn't just say like, okay, it says you allow all cookies, allow selected cookies. And if you click show details, then you get um, not multiple tabs, but a single layer with all the detailed definitions of each type of cookie. Uh, and it even explains what you should do uh, if you change your mind. And it has a cookie preferences button, which you can see in the bottom right, which always sits on the screen on the website. You can, so you can always come back and reverse your decision. Then we had a worst practices variant that um, did a lot of things wrong. Uh, this is the banner design um, at the bottom of the page. You can ignore it. You don't have to interact with it. Um, it, has, uh, it has a link, not a button, if you want to go and um, and, and change your, your preferences. And we had this interface with all of these different tabs rather than everything on all, all on one page. Um, it even has some text that suggests to you that you might be losing out if you don't accept all the cookies. Uh, it's a big paragraph of text and we have just a generic okay button. It's not entirely sure what that does. Um, it doesn't mention any way of reversing your decision if you change your mind. Okay, and this is what it looks like on a website. Okay, then we had a variant where we didn't have any banner. We just had a cookie preferences button that would then show you this cookie preferences screen. And so it looked like this. You'd come to the website and you could easily ignore it if you wanted to. 
Um, I don't have time to go through all the different variations, but we, uh, we, we tested a bunch of other things so that we could isolate, uh, you know, whether there um, uh, was a banner at the bottom of the screen or whether it was in the center of the screen, whether there was a link or whether it was a button, whether we had uh, bullets or paragraphs. Um, so lots of different variations and we isolated each one of them. And here's what our results are. Um, so each of these uh, horizontal bars represents a condition. Um, and what we're seeing here is the percentage of, of uh, participants who made each decision. So the red participants, they were the ones who said, I only want strictly necessary cookies. The blue ones, not very many, um, made some very specific decision of allowing some cookies, but not others. The green ones took all cookies and the purple ones didn't make any choice at all um, when they, they were on the website. And what we can see is that um, uh, for the best practices and some of the small changes that we made, um, we have uh, a lot of participants who said, hey, I'm not gonna take all cookies, I just want strictly necessary. Um, but in uh, the, the um, conditions where they weren't shown all the options, most people just took all cookies or even worse in the non-blocking ones where they could ignore it, well, a lot of them did um, and they just didn't interact with it at all. Okay, so we see that the absence of a fully blocking or banner notice led to poor awareness. So, you know, if you just put that cookie preferences in the corner and do nothing else, and there are real websites that do this, um, most people completely ignore it. And um, in fact, most of them don't even notice that it's there. Um, we also find that uh, if we don't show people the options, they have a lot less investment in their decision making. Um, we found that, um, that after people made their decision, if there was a cookie preferences button, then they were much more able to figure out how to reverse their decision later. Um, uh, even though in all cases there was a cookie preferences link buried in the bottom, but we had many more people who said that they understood how to reverse their preference when it was a button versus when it was a link. Um, and uh, we found that the names of the cookie categories themselves, performance cookies and functional cookies, which are the standard that is been used for a long time, completely confused people. Only 16% of participants understood what functional cookies were. Um, and so this seems pretty problematic and maybe we should come up with better terminology. Okay, and then finally, I wanna mention this notion of the burden of user consent. Um, doing all this on every website is a, a lot of burden for users. And um, we really should think about solutions that don't require users to jump through all these hoops and do all this on every website. So finally, some takeaways here. Um, so first of all, um, there we should be thinking about alternatives to long privacy notices that can help users obtain information they need quickly. Um, icons might be a good idea, uh, but we have to remember that it's difficult to convey privacy concepts with icons, and we should think about having accompanying words when we have icons. Um, we should try to reduce the user burden uh, by having standardized interfaces, search engines, and user, user agents so that users don't have to go read all this at every website they visit with every device that they use. Um, we should incentivize the adoption of the privacy options button and other standardized interfaces. Uh, we should remember that interface design has a large impact on the choices people make. Uh, and the previous speaker showed you that, I showed you more data about that. Um, and we really need to make it in the context of cookies, except only necessary cookies should be just as easy as accept all cookies. And then whatever you do, do user testing. User testing is essential for evaluating usability. You can't just look at it and say, oh yeah, I know what users are gonna do here. Um, and there are a bunch of different um, things that we should probably consider when we do user testing and we've, we've outlined them here. All right, so that, that's it for me for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Craner. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, very, very informative um, presentation. Um, so uh, I'll just wait uh, for wonderful for the slides to uh, 
not be shared anymore. And I'm now pleased to introduce our final speaker for today, Ms. Stacy Schesser, who will be discussing opt-out preference signals in the California Consumer Privacy Act. Stacy Schesser is the Supervising Deputy Attorney General for the Privacy Unit in the Consumer Protection Section of the Office of the California Attorney General. Her recent matters include People versus Glow, People versus Equifax, and leading the team that drafted regulations for the California Consumer Privacy Act. As contemplated in the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, Ms. Schesser is supporting the CPPA in its work. Ms. Chester began her career at the Attorney General's Office in 2007 in its criminal division and has worked in the privacy unit since that unit's inception in 2012. In 2019, Ms. Chester was recognized as one of the recorders Women Leaders in Tech Law, and she was the only public sector recipient of this award. Ms. Chester received her JD at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, where she wrote on privacy law issues for the California Law Review. She received her BA at Douglas College and Rutgers University. Ms. Chesser, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen to begin my presentation. Okay, uh, good afternoon and thank you so much for having me. Um, I am going to be presenting on opt-out preference signals and the CCPA. Uh, you already heard my bio from Chair Urban, um, so I'm just going to dive right in. But of course, being a lawyer, I'm going to make sure that we give the typical disclaimer that this presentation uh, reflects my views. It may not reflect the views of the state of California or the Attorney General. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by just giving some key takeaways about what I'm hoping this presentation uh, will cover today. Um, I want to start by actually reminding the board that uh, the Attorney General's office was sitting in the same exact spot as, as you are now, nearly four years ago. We had to be strategic and deliberate about how to craft rules so that they were workable for consumers and businesses alike. Uh, we had to contemplate all types of contexts in which consumers would be exercising their rights online and offline, as well as consider small businesses and large businesses compliance. The right to opt out is a critical component of CCPA, and the statute's text required that we focus on how to operationalize this right to opt out. In comparison to the other rights, the CCPA intended stopping the sale of information to be easy. For example, unlike the right to know or the right to delete, the right to opt out is not verified and has very little exceptions. One of the other things that we had heard from stakeholders, which I'll go through today, was about how difficult it was to control the proliferation of their data in the marketplace. I've spoken publicly before about the burden of self-management of one's privacy rights. After all, uh, we are all consumers. Some of us are busy parents. We have multiple jobs um, and we're faced with constant decision-making. Figuring out how to control who your data is sold to should not be task intensive or burdensome. And so offering consumers a global option would help facilitate the submission of an opt-out request. Lastly, I wanna point out that with the regulations in place, the AG is actively enforcing the CCPA, including those that pertain to the user-enabled global privacy control set forth in the regulations. We have a law in place, we are going to enforce it. Okay, so I wanna start quickly in talking about our goal of operationalizing the right to opt out. The civil code section 1798.185, the same provision that's going to guide your rulemaking analysis, required us to promulgate regulations in a whole host of areas. It included subdivision 4A and B, which the language here gave us indication that we had the authority to write rules that facilitated or eased how a consumer can make an opt out request to stop their personal information, the sale of their personal information, excuse me. Excuse me. And conversely, we also had to write rules on how businesses had to handle or process requests once they were received. Additionally, in the statute, we had broad authority to adopt regulations as necessary to further the purposes of CCPA. We could adopt regulations that filled in the details not specifically addressed by the, the text of the statute, but fell within its scope. So while, for example, 
the text of the statute set a baseline requirement for businesses that sell personal information to post a do not sell my personal information link. It did not foreclose the Office of the Attorney General from also establishing additional mechanisms to facilitate the submission of a consumer's opt out request. <clears throat> The right to opt out is the hallmark of CCPA. Um, this is something that when we first started our rulemaking process, we had to consider. And so we started with the text of the statute. At the outset, you've heard about how CCPA is about consumer rights. Indeed, CIPRA, which amended CCPA, now includes the word rights in the title. More importantly, it's about things, th these rights that belong to the consumer, which we all are. We approached this this rulemaking task through the lens of the right rooted in the California Consumer Privacy Act, not the Business Mitigating Legal Risks When Selling Information Act. The text itself was important and critical. You have the right at any time to direct. Um, this, this is forceful and meant to be robust. You also, the right means to stop selling personal information to third parties. Also within the text were special protections for minors. You cannot sell unless you have permission either from the minor age 13 to 16 or from the parent or guardian under 13. These were new protections and they were, they were supposed to be meaningful. <clears throat> There's other important clues within the text that guided our analysis of how to draft regulations. For example, it's a clear binary action, sell or do not sell. Businesses were also required to be transparent if they sold by the law. There's a requirement to clearly disclose that you do sell, namely by posting the link on your website as well as posting it in your privacy policies. There's also requirements to train employees on how this works. All individuals responsible for handling inquiries are informed of all requirements in 1798.120 and how to direct consumers to exercise their rights. And then finally, the right to, to opt out should be respected and good for one year. Um, we also considered context. The CCPA is the first law in the nation to vest consumers with this critical right. Fortifying this right so that it's meaningful for consumers requires that the Office of Attorney General establish robust set of rules and procedures. Nothing in the legislative history indicated that the legislature intended to limit rulemaking. And the provisions, as, as I said before, referred to the, the section that set forth the right, 1798.120, the right itself and not merely the attendant obligations for compliance. Finally, and something I really would like to share with you is that we listen to stakeholders. <clears throat> There's one particular stakeholder that comes to mind um, when, during our pre-rulemaking activities as well. Um, she was named Louise and she spoke at one of our, our meetings in Sacramento. She stuck out, out to me personally because we wanted to hear from consumers. We had heard from a variety of stakeholders, including industry, about their positions. And so I'm quoting from the transcript that's um, of that meeting, uh, which is posted on our website, and you could, you could read it, but I'm reading it for clarity and to conserve time. Louise said, quote, after listening to the comments so far, I am largely here to say, help. I am an educated person, reasonably computer literate. I have never made it all the way through an opt-out procedure. They splinter, they go here and there, they require you to log into your account. And then when you get there, you don't know what the definitions are of what you are opting in or out to. So we need help and we need it from you." End quote. She pointed out that some consumers don't enjoy how the internet relies on their personal advertise on their personal information in order to serve advertisements. She noted that there was a large market for something called an ad blocker, which is an extension that a consumer can download and install to their browser. She ended by saying, as you work to implement this law, consider what people can actually see and understand about what's being collected and how it's used. Because overall, I think it's been used to our harm and getting a data dump isn't going to help. Thank you for the opportunity and please remember all of us out there who just don't know what's going on. What I think Louise meant here by things like when she referred to a data dump and her overall confusion was that figuring out how to navigate the opt-out process especially was complicated, time-consuming and decision fatiguing. It was our job to make it easier for consumers to advance protecting privacy. It sounded to me like Louise was tired of always being asked, are you sure each time she visited a website? <clears throat> and, and, and just to echo some of the previous uh, presentations that we've heard today, we know that this is sometimes done through things like deception or to deter a consumer from taking an action that they intend to do. 
Lastly, we also relied on our experience as enforcers. Um, I have spoke repeatedly about how I work on a very talented team of attorneys. Um, we've been doing privacy enforcement for a while. We've been on this, a cop on this beat. And one of the things we've seen is our work um, and how the laws should be working better for consumers. One of the laws that we've been enforcing for some time now is the California Online Privacy Protection Act or CALAPA. It's an important law. It was also a law that was first in the nation and was intended to require robust privacy disclosures and a privacy policy. Um, it was also meant to give transparency and allow consumers to have all the information they needed before they proceeded or opted to use a website or an online service. I'd like to call your attention to this provision of CALAPA um, that required to, a disclosure how an operator of a website responds to web browser do not track signals or other mechanisms that provide consumers the ability to exercise choice regarding the collection of personal information, personally identifiable information, excuse me, about an individual consumer's online activities over time and across third party websites or online services. As the primary enforcer of CALAPA, my team has reviewed thousands of privacy policies for compliance with CALAPA. And we found that the majority of businesses will write something similar to this. This is the do not track disclosure that, that companies will make, um, including the last sentence that simply states, we do not respond to do not, do not track signals. So we may not be aware of, or we may be unable to respond to such signals. Put another way, if given a choice, businesses were disclosing that they simply will not comply with a do not track signal. And if they given a choice on how to comply, they will choose not to comply with the, the signal itself. As we discussed in our initial statement of reasons, imposing a mandatory requirement on businesses to process a global signal was something that was necessary to keep from preventing businesses from subverting or ignoring a consumer tool related to their rights and specifically the exercise of their CCPA right to opt out. If we were going to facilitate the submission of an opt-out request by consumers, we were mindful that we had to make sure that businesses were required to respond and effectively comply with the request. We, this led us to draft uh, regulation 999.315 having to do with requests to opt out. Here is the portion of the statute um, that takes into consideration what is known as a user-enabled global privacy control. Um, a user-enabled global privacy control is something that includes a browser plugin or a privacy setting, a device setting, or some type of mechanism that would communicate or signal a consumer's choice to opt out of the sale of personal information is a valid request that's submitted pursuant to 1798.120. Um, this, this rule and the, the entirety of the subdivision uses words to reflect that the right to opt out should be easy for consumers, involve minimal steps, and be complied with as soon as feasibly possible. The global control is exactly that. It's an on or off switch for consumers. It's intended to be for those consumers that are too busy, too distracted, or overwhelmed by all the prompts and boxes and just want to stop the sale of their data. Making it a global setting is reflected that this right again is different. It, does, it should be a, a, a right that does not require further information from the consumer. And it's a, it's a binary on or off, sell or do not sell request. I wanna draw your attention to one area in which we contemplated a modification to the, to the regulation and ultimately decided not to include language. That language is reflected in the blue cross out and I'm gonna walk through this a little bit closely. There was a lot of robust commentary on our regulation and we addressed each and every comment in our rulemaking documents. Again, um, the requirement was that, that the control was that should be developed in accordance with the regulations clearly communicate or signal that a consumer intends to opt out of sale. Uh, we contemplated the question also, as, as proposed by original language, of whether the privacy control should have a default setting, and we heard from both sides in public comment. One side said that the privacy control should not be defaulted on, and that defaulting it off would align with consumer choice. Others pointed out that some consumers choose products because they are designed with privacy in mind, and that choice should be expressed via the user-enabled privacy control. The latter viewpoint was compelling. 
the global privacy control did not need specific language, excuse me, the regulation involving the global privacy control did not need specific language regarding whether the signal should be on or off by default, because it contemplated that consumers may choose privacy by design products and to have the control built in and turned on. Let me say this again, so I want to make it very clear. Consumers can choose privacy. Selecting a product that already builds in high privacy protections is a sufficient expression alone that a consumer wants to protect her privacy. After all, why would we write a regulation that would require that consumers have to continuously provide separate consent? Consumers have grown tired of being repeatedly asked, are you sure? To address the concern that consumers could be frustrated if a global privacy setting was defaulted on, the remedy here would just be for a consumer to go in and disable their, their global privacy control or revert back to, go, to the granularity of going website by website and clicking the do not sell my personal information link. Thus, the, regula the regulation reflects that selecting a privacy by design product or service is the affirmative choice in and of itself for the user to enable an opt-out mechanism. Any additional steps are not necessary, and some of these additional steps would even frustrate the consumer who seeks a comprehensive privacy approach. Lastly, I just want to point out our final statement of reasons. We intended to, draw, to draft the regulation so that it was forward-looking. We thought that there would be a new control that could be developed to comply with the regulation, one that would encourage innovation and have technology be used for the good of advancing consumer privacy. The regulation is central to protecting the consumer's right to opt out, reflecting the value of a right for consumers who are too busy or too overwhelmed to use it, consumers like Louise, but consumers actually also like each of us that don't have the time, energy, or resources to go website by website, browser by browser for each and every device for themselves and for their families. We affirm that a global choice, an on-off switch, when given, it is a good choice to make, and given the ease and frequency by which personal information is collected and sold when a consumer visits a website, consumers themselves should have a similarly easy ability to request to opt out globally. This regulation was approved by OAL after, again, robust discussion during the comment periods in which we considered each and every comment. Um, I'd like to also note that we have been enforcing the regulations. The enforcement uh, date for CCPA began on July 1st, 2020. We began enforcing the statute then and the regulations once they became finalized and approved by OAL in August. On July 1st, 2021, we posted on our website case examples after one year of, of CCP enforcement that included notices of alleged noncompliance that had gone out to businesses and, and, and other entities. And included in this list, this example involving a business that was not processing requests submitted via a user-enabled global privacy control. Again, we continue to enforce CCPA and all of its provisions, including 1798.120, 0 0.135, and regulation um, in, in included in 999.315. <clears throat> we also have engaged in consumer education, such as posting on our website about how to exercise all of your rights under CCPA, um, including the right to opt out and what the user-enabled global privacy control means. So again, just to wrap up, I want to make sure that um, these are my key takeaways. Um, ultimately, we think that consumers should be able to make technology also work for them. They should be able to have the option to flip a switch that tells all businesses to stop selling my data. This provides a critical power dynamic of businesses where selling personal information is the default. It vests consumer with a, consumers with a mechanism to stop the proliferation of their data in the marketplace with a tool that is mindful of the burdens consumers face with the self-management of their privacy. The CCPA's requirement of a do not sell link on every website was a great start, but having an, a global option is a critical mechanism to facilitate the submission of requests to opt out. It is encouraging to see innovation in the privacy by design space, as well as businesses and even other states that are taking their cues from the groundbreaking work here done in California. An opt-out preference signal should be something that is available to all consumers and that is easy, streamlined, and minimal. For companies that are not implementing and building processes to comply with the regulations and the law, we are enforcing. And this is something that we also know. Um, businesses are speaking to one another and attorneys have commented to us that receiving enforcement 
notices have been effective towards compliance. We will continue to enforce this regulation and the entirety of CCPA to protect and advance consumers' privacy rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Jesser. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers today for sharing their deep expertise with us. As a reminder, our guest presenter's view should not be taken as the views of the agency or the board. They are the presenter's views only. That said, um, I really very much appreciate the care with which all of our speakers today presented some um, complex topics. And I think that um, we will all find it useful and, and hope that others do too. Thank you to everyone um, who uh, has joined us today and continues to join us. We are going to uh, now welcome public comment. Um, as I mentioned, um, we would do at the end of the presentations today. Um, for those of you who um, don't need this, please bear with me. I just wanna be sure it's clear for everyone. If you want to speak on an item, please use the raise your hand function, which can be found in the reaction feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will request you unmute yourself for comment. And when your comment is completed, the moderator We'll meet you again. It's helpful if you identify yourself, but of course it's entirely voluntary. Um, you do not have to. Reminder of the rules of the road. Um, please uh, keep your um, comments to three minutes, which is the limit to make sure that everyone has the same amount of time. And Bagley King does require that comments be connected um, to the agenda item. So um, please feel free and to, to plan to comment on topics in any of today's presentations um, uh, and to, um, um, uh, and to, um, uh, to think about that as your, as your topic. I also want to note that to please realize that the board cannot generally respond, but please don't think we're not listening. All information, including all public comments are being recorded and transcribed, as I mentioned earlier, and will be available for the board, the staff, and the public to review. And if you have any questions at all, please do write to info at cppa.ca.gov. With that, thank you um, everyone um, who is considering commenting. And I will ask Mr. Gourley, is there public comment from anyone in the audience at this time? Uh, yes, Chairperson Urban, we have a few. Um, so I will start with, Terry, you now have permission to unmute yourself. Uh, Mr. Gorley, do you want to try unmuting um, Terry? Yes, I've asked him to unmute. Terry, okay. uh, if you have you have permission to unmute yourself. All right, um, Mr. Gorley, I suggest that um, we move on to the next person and then circle back just in case our first commenter walked away and needs to walk back. Okay, uh, Sharon, you now have permission. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of feedback. Um, I know we have special protections that we've vindicated for and opt in if they're aged persons under 16. I think we need to do that for seniors as well over a certain age or whatever, because I think there's another problem with technology. There's a problem with protecting us and we are a vulnerable population. So I'd like to see that being considered. Another question, another comment I'd like to make is, um, I'm a little confused how analytics play into it versus a broker. So that's something that I'm trying to work out and understand a little bit better. And then the, the problem is if there's a speaker on that's, that's fabulous, but they're maybe speaking too quickly, I have no way to make any comments about that or let you know, hey, could you slow down a little or whatever. So this is my first time of going to this thing. I stayed for the whole entire thing. I learned a lot of information, but it's not a style that's really user friendly for a consumer. It's set up for board members. It's, it's not set up for me to go ahead and say, hey, can you clarify that or do whatever? So I just, just wanted to share that information. And then that this wonderful research that's being done, uh, it's great. And yet I'm worried that the, the companies, 
that we're going to use that information to modify, well, hey, we can't hold 15 seconds, but we can use 10 seconds. So I'm saying it's, it's a double-edged sword. That research that's being done can also be used for the people that want to manipulate us. And I just wanted to get that out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Beckest, and for your question earlier today. Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, Mr. Gorley, is there another commenter? Yes. Uh, Jennifer, you now have permission. You can unmute yourself. Thank you very much, and thank you for this time. My name is Jennifer Huddleston, and I am policy counsel with NetChoice, a trade association dedicated to, to keeping the internet safe for free enterprise and free expression. I just wanted to make a comment regarding some of the information that was presented today, that the, CC, the CPPA should be careful when it's considering how to go about rulemaking, not to regulate the beneficial uses of algorithms in a desire to define dark patterns and avoid um, what it considers harmful uses. Beneficial algorithms are very helpful in making our experience online much better, including helping us to avoid spam and underpin many of the services that make the internet the, th the, the way it is today. Additionally, any rulemaking that the CPPA focuses on should focus on those issues that are related to privacy. Oftentimes there are trade-offs that need to be carefully considered when it comes to user speech and issues like content moderation, and the agency should be careful to ensure that it's staying within its mandate to focus on privacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Huddleston. Uh, Mr. Gorley, are there further commenters? Uh, yes, uh, Cecilia, uh, you now have permission to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thanks so much. I simply wanted to thank uh, the board and the agency for putting this presentation together. I joined, um, I'm a privacy professional. I joined thinking that this was an informational about, a, you know, it was, I wasn't well informed about today's session, but I was very, very happy to see what was presented today. The information provided was extremely uh, informational and insightful. And I just want to thank everyone that put this together. That was my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Newman, and I'm sure everyone who worked on it greatly appreciates that. Okay, uh, Maureen, you now have permission. Chair, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Maureen Mahoney of Consumer Reports. I very much appreciate um, the presentations and wanted to take this opportunity to highlight a few issues that we think are important with respect to the rulemaking. Um, in our view, consumers' privacy should be protected by default through strong data minimization that prohibits all unnecessary data processing so that consumers can use online services and apps safely without having to take additional action. But at the very least, Measures based largely on an opt-out model like the CCPA should be workable for consumers and the new regulations should clarify that businesses are required to honor browser privacy signals as an opt-out of sharing and sale consistent with the plain language of CPRA and consistent with existing AG regulations. And without this, consumers will have few options but to opt out at every company one by one, even though there are hundreds, if not thousands of companies that sell consumer data. Second, it's important to make sure that the opt-out is comprehensive. We urge the agency to help ensure that when a consumer opts out, companies can't make their personal information available to third parties for a commercial purpose. We found that some companies have ignored the opt-out with respect to behavioral advertising under the CCPA, instead sent consumers to ineffective third-party industry opt-outs, which undermines the purpose of the law. Um, CIPRA takes help take steps to help address this, including an opt-out of sharing, but given bad faith interpretations of the CCPA, I think it should be reiterated that retargeting in particular is covered by the CPRA opt-out. All of this will help ensure that consumers are easily able to exercise their privacy preferences, one of the key goals of the law. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Mr. Gorley, are there further public commenters? Yes, we have another one. Uh, Angelina, you now have permission. Hi. Oh dear. Mr. Gorley, do we still have Ms. Laos? Uh, there she is. All right, Ms. Laos, apologies for that. Please do go ahead. I think you can talk now. Okay, no worries. Uh, so thank you all so much for putting this together. It was quite helpful. 
to be able to identify the use cases that are contemplated under the CPRA. I know that there's been um, just a lot of kind of confusion around those. Um, one thing that I would like to suggest is to have a bit more clarity on the interplay between the CCPA, CPRA, and COPPA. I understand that there's a preemption, you know, clause in the CPRA, you know, saying that it sh it really supplements and should not conflict with COPPA. And I think that's true with regard to opt-in to collection. That's quite clear. And with a, to, to a certain extent with the opt-out of sale with requiring verifiable parental consent from minors, et cetera. But I think that's not so clear with regard to the opt-outs. And I think um, with, you know, do not share for cross context, limit the use of, uh, limit the use and disclosure of my sensitive PI. I think it's unclear whether uh, verifiable parental consent will be needed, you know, kind of what approach should um, entities or businesses take with regard to children exercising the, those opt-outs versus adults? I think we just need a bit more clarity around that. Thank you very much, Ms. Laos. Um, Mr. Gorley, do we have remaining public commenters? Yep, we have one more. Uh, Leo, you now have permission to unmute. Hi, I'm Leo. I'm a UCLA third year law student and focus on technology law. Um, thank you, first of all, for this panel. It was really inform informative. Um, I have my, so my comment would be on, although CC, the CCPA requires business to maintain reasonable security practices in order to shield them from liability in the event of data breaches, um, but the statute do not define um, what constitutes reasonable security. Um, so, so currently what business do is that they look at federal guidelines such as state and IST frameworks for recommendations to demonstrate that reasonable security practice. Um, however, the guidelines are really like voluntary and it's not that effective. So, um, the, so the law will not achieve its goal until this, there's a mandate to um, tell what the companies should do um, to, to actually have teeth um, to achieve the goal of protecting the, the data of the customers. And that goes back to um, the panel, what the panel said about the dark patterns that how easily and fragile the customers can be um, and how um, manipulative um, those uh, techniques could be. So um, if the agency could make clear of the definition of reasonable security in that statute, um, it would be greatly appreciated by the industry and the academic as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hawaii. Um, Mr. Gorley, do we have further public comment? Uh, there is no further comment at this time, Chairperson Urban. Thank you, Mr. Gorley. As before, I will wait just a little while in case um, anyone's formulating thoughts. Um, so we'll give it a minute or so. All right, my deep gratitude to everyone who took the time to comment during public comments and again to our speakers for today. Um, we will now recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow, March 30th, when we will continue with the pre-rulemaking information sessions. If you wanna see what topics are coming up, um, uh, that's on the agenda for day two. And I'll just emphasize that because we started at 11 today, tomorrow we're starting at a different time at 9 a.m. And we hope to see anyone who's interested there. Thank you very much. We are now in recess.